and we'll start. We are recording. Okay, well, welcome to the uh, December, what, 17th meeting of the Dyna Transportation Commission. Uh, we'll begin this meeting by having roll call. Commissioner Aller? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Kane? Here. Commissioner Lafferty? Here. Commissioner McCarthy? Here. Commissioner Plum Smith? Chair Richmond? Here. Commissioner Shearer? Commissioner Atry? Commissioner Atry? He's got a thumbs up. Can you can you unmute Nihar and uh, and say here? He is unmuted. I just can't. His audio is not coming through. Ah, uh, okay. We can all attest for the audio that he's doing a thumbs up and truly here. <laughs> Who's next, okay. Andrew? You mentioned in the chat. I'm going to mark him as here. Uh, Commissioner okay. Clark? Here. And Commissioner Kariwala? Here. Wonderful. Thanks. And it's nice to have a full house of our student commissioners. Welcome back, you three. Um, we will begin by um, taking a look at the agenda. Anyone have uh, comments or questions on the agenda? Hearing none, I'll take a motion to approve. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Um, all in favor of approving the agenda as presented, please say aye when your name is called. Commissioner Aller? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Thank you. Commissioner Kane? Aye. Commissioner Lafferty? Aye. Commissioner McCarthy? Aye. Chair Richmond? Aye. Agenda's approved. Great. Thank you. Next on that agenda is approval of the meeting minutes from the November 19th meeting. Uh, comments, questions, changes? Hearing none, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of the November 19th um, meeting as presented. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Thanks, Peter. Is there a second? Second. Seconded. Uh, approved and seconded. Please uh, signify by saying aye when your name is called. Commissioner Aller? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Kane? Aye. Commissioner Lafferty? Aye. Commissioner McCarthy? Aye. Chair Richmond? Aye. Minutes approved. Fantastic. Um, then we can move right into our reports and recommendations section. Uh, and I think the floor is yours, Andrew, to talk with us about the um, um, speed limit public engagement report. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's see, all right. So um, today I'm gonna, uh, I'll summarize the, where our recommendations are right now, talk about the public engagement process that we just completed, um, provide a summary of the input that we received, how that impacted the recommendation, uh, and then our next steps, and then provide opportunity for questions and comments at the end. So it's kind of a recap. I gave a similar presentation to the commission back in July, um, but in general, the city has supported lowering speed limits uh, since at least 2006, um, and the transportation has been a, a player in that. Um, lower speed limits uh, support the goals of our comprehensive plan, our living streets plan, and our pedestrian bicycle master plan. 
uh, particularly in two categories, safety in that lower speeds reduce the likelihood and severity of motor vehicle crashes, and in terms of promoting equity in that lower speed limits prioritize our vulnerable road users over our motorists. So they prioritize pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there was a previous approach that was uh, reviewed by the commission back in July. Um, this That was a, what we call a tiered approach. Uh, where there's kind of a default citywide limit of 20 miles per hour on residential streets and then a 25 mile per hour limit on our municipal state aid or collector roads uh, and then 30 mile an hour on some of the arterial systems. So this is the this is an approach that uh, mimics what the city of Minneapolis has recently implemented. Pre as I, we presented that to the commission back in July for comments and then presented to city council at a work session. At that work session, council had concerns about uh, confusion for users, given the kind of wider range of speed limits throughout the city. Uh, and so they directed staff to pursue a more a uniform 25 mile an hour approach. And to look at um, reviewing specific limits or different limits on our municipal state aid roads. So that's why you'll see a. Uh, there's a, you'll see a difference between this previous recommendation and the updated recommendation. Oops. Sorry, waiting for my computer to catch up. Okay, so this is the updated draft recommendation. So as I mentioned, it's a 25 mile an hour default speed limit on all streets. Uh, you notice there are some 20 mile an hour local streets that are recommended up along the border of St. Louis Park. Um, these are recommended for 20 because they are either along the border with St. Louis Park, who is recommending, who is currently looking at 20 mile an hour speed limits, or their locations where the street changes jurisdiction mid block. So the, the, the thinking is that uh, it'd be preferential to change the speed limit um, at an intersection rather than change it mid block to make it easier for the users to understand. Uh, in the red, you see the, so the streets that we're currently recommending for 30 miles an hour. Um, these are primarily four lane streets or are streets that have a high amount of non local traffic. So Interlochen, 50th, Valley View, and uh, 69th in Southdale, um, Metro Boulevard, and a portion of 70th adjacent to Highway 100, as well as a, a por significant portion of the uh, I 494 and 169 frontage road system. In green, you see the 20 mile an hour uh, school zone speed limit on major streets, and then 15 miles an hour on uh, minor streets within school zones. These are generally in keeping with the current restrictions for school zones. And then 10 miles per hour on alleys is recommended, which is identical to the current restriction. So we posted these this recommendation on Better Together, we created a project page uh, to let residents provide feedback on these draft limits. And there were two main, two main opportunities for input to be given. One was through uh, this map tool, where if you if users clicked on it, they it pulled up this interactive map that had the uh, proposed recommendations overlaid. And then users had the opportunity to drop pins on specific street segments to indicate uh, their preference for the speed limit on that street. So it ranged from 20 miles an hour, 25, 30 to 35 miles per hour. Um, in addition to placing a pin, users could also uh, provide a comment to supplement that. The second way was through our feedback form, which was essentially just a one question survey um, asking uh, commenters to provide general comments on uh, general comments or questions on the draft recommended speed limits. So this is a, a comparison of our uh, the level of engagement for the speed limit evaluation compared to uh, another recent engagement effort, West 58th Street. So the green bars indicate the local speed limit engagement and the gray bars uh, represent West 58th Street. So we had about half the number of site visits as West 58th Street, little just about a thousand site visits uh, in the months that we had the project up. Um, 
we had a fairly significant amount of aware visitors. Um, these are users that viewed at least one page on the project site. The next level would be informed users, which is just about half of all people who visited the site. Um, these are users who viewed multiple pages on the site or downloaded the document that was on the project page. And then finally, we have our engaged visitors, 138 people who uh, participated in a survey. So as I mentioned, there's fewer site visits than what we saw for 58th Street, but we did see a higher level of engagement um, than 58th Street comparing the engaged users to the total site visits. You can see here 58th Street had uh, 87 engaged visitors out of more than 2,000 visits to the site. Um, something to keep in mind, 58th Street, this only reflects the Better Together engagement. Um, 58th Street did have a significant amount of in-person engagement, which is not reflected in this uh, on this graphic. So this is a quick summary of the, the three different ways that we received feedback from the public. So the graph on the left shows the feedback form responses. We received 131 submissions through the feedback form. Of those, little over half were supportive of the current recommendation. Another about 14% uh, expressed support for 20 mile an hour speed limits, um, mimicking what the city of Minneapolis has implemented. About 24% were unsupportive of the current recommendation. And then about 11% of comments uh, were grouped in this other category where um, staff wasn't able to determine specifically whether they were supportive or unsupportive. Um, these comments also included just general questions and observations uh, that again, didn't seem to reflect support or opposition for the recommendation. Uh, on the upper right, uh, this is a graph showing the, a breakdown of the pins that were placed on the map application. So we had 36 pins that were placed citywide, uh, and they're grouped based on whether or not the, the the pins dropped reflected a preference for a higher, lower speed limit than what's recommended, or a speed limit equal to what's currently being recommended. So a little more than half of the pins overall, 19 out of 36, recommended uh, higher speed limits than what's currently proposed. Six were equal, and 11 uh requested lower speed limits. What I think is interesting about this is if you break it down between pins that were placed on state aid roads and pins that were placed on local roads, you see a clear trend here where the vast majority of the state aid pins, the preference is for a higher speed than the proposed 25, generally, generally 30 miles an hour was the preference. And then on the local side, um, the preference was for lower speed limits than what's currently recommended generally the preference being 20 miles an hour. Um, so the map comments uh, seem to indicate a, a preference for a tiered system more like what Minneapolis has. Can I ask a question, Andrew? Sure. So of the people that submitted this survey, how, how many were verified as residents of the city of Edina? Uh, we don't have a process for, uh, as far as I know, we don't have a process for verifying that. They're, the users are just, um, as far as I know, anybody can sign up to have an account on Better Together. I have a question. What are the thoughts from the city on the significance of the population size? Without me having a lot of experience with city um, polls or surveys, 131 seems small. I agree with that, Kirk. Uh, so the question is, what are our thoughts on how how valid the, or meaningful the level of engagement compared to this population? Yeah, I know it's a tiny amount, but I, I, I yes, and and just if I can help make my question clear, it's like I'm curious: was there a statistical evaluation on the validity of this data being only 131 um, responses for? Sure, that's a good question. So we didn't do any kind of statistical evaluation. Uh, I just presented the comparison to 58th Street to just kind of give a point of reference. Um, we didn't do any, as far as I know, we didn't do any kind of statistical evaluation for 58th Street either. Um, generally, generally speaking, it's it's difficult to get close to, well, 
the city doesn't have a kind of an established threshold of a like a percentage of the population that we're trying to reach through these through this online public engagement. I mean, generally, the the more the better. Um, but I'm just kind of presenting these numbers as they are and leaving it up to the uh, commission or the council to comment on the um, how valid it, or gets to okay. comment on how valid they think they are. I, I mean. I mean, I think this is in, it's information, but it's really. I mean, it's, it doesn't really tell us anything. I mean, it's, it's something better than 0, but it's maybe worth. I mean, I, in my opinion, it's not worth very much. I'm not saying. That it's not valid information. I'm just saying it's, it's, it's such a small fraction. Of the population and. So, I guess we've already said that. I have a question. Is there any way to compare it to um, if we had in person feedback opportunities on a project that might be similar that would allow for city meetings on it? What kind of numbers we typically get for feedback in those cases? You know, is it that because of our current situation, the only opportunity is to provide online feedback and maybe people are full on that versus? Um, how many people typically would comment on this kind of thing, even if they had the opportunity to come in person, which sometimes takes more effort than going online. Sure, that's a good point. Um, I can certainly look to uh, do some research on that and, and include that in my report before council. Um, I guess as a kind of a, a, a another point of reference, so thinking about the um, I'll just say generally public engagement can be very difficult for these citywide initiatives compared to more targeted projects like the street reconstructions because we can uh, it's more feasible for those smaller projects to send direct mailings to every property. In this case, it wasn't really feasible to send a letter out to every single property in the city um, to request feedback on it. So if you kind of compare it to the engagement of like the comprehensive plan or like the pedestrian and bicycle master plan. Um, the pedestrian and bicycle master plan also encompassed the entire city, uh, but I believe we only received somewhere between three and 600 comments or participants in it. So just kind of a comparison of how that an effort like that uh, reflected the population of the city. Andrew, if I could, one more question when you gave a comment on the earlier proposal for a, a more of a base 20 miles per hour and and compared that with this one did you say that one reason a, a drawback or a, a minus for the the first version um, was it was confusing or it was too many or can you there was can you a, repeat that sure so uh, when the original recommendation uh, was presented to council at a work session with the 20 mile an hour default limits, the tiered approach like Minneapolis. The concern that was expressed by some members of council was that they were. Not necessarily that they were confused, but that they were concerned that drivers would be confused um, at the varying at the number of different limits throughout the city. Um, was, was, that, was that addressed or improved? Because if I counted correctly, there were five or six. If you count the St. Louis Park um, variation, I think there were six different speeds in the in this current one. So it seemed like there were equal, if not more, speeds in this this version. So I was sure. curious if if that was addressing the council's earlier concern. So I think the. Um... That's a, a good point and I'm happy to clarify. So the confusion, I don't think was not necessarily tied to the range of speeds because you're correct. Both both recommendations have the same range of speeds, but the this updated evaluation is more consistent in having there's a there's a greater number of streets that all fit into a 25 mile an hour default speed. There's not so much um, on on an average trip, I guess I'd say. Generally speaking, the streets are all going to be 25 miles an hour versus going from a 20 to a 25 to a 30, maybe back to a 25. I think that was the concern that council had. Um, as far as the school zone speed limits, those, like I mentioned before, those are generally consistent with what's in place right now. Um, so the most significant change between 
this recommendation and what's in place right now is um, our streets that are currently signed at 30 or 40 um, would be dropped to either 30 or 25. Uh, Thank you, Andrew. I, you're correct that the, the St. Louis Park kind of corner here is an exception um, to that, but it's kind of targeted to a specific area where, again, in theory, if St. Louis Park's implementate or St. Louis Park approves their proposed plan, um, all of those streets to the north would also be 20 miles an hour. And then also okay. to the east, um, 20 to go to Minneapolis then too, I think. Yeah, I've, and I've got two questions. One is, uh, did the council folks uh, address, when they talked about the confusion of the drivers, did they recognize that our bordering cities were going to be different than than, Minneapolis, than uh, Edina was planning to go to? And how, were, how would drivers adapt to that? I mean, did they did they recognize that then there'd be likely be discrepancies between Edina and at least two of its bordering communities, and probably three? My guess would be Rich. I don't. Maybe you know what Richfield is planning to do. Um, sorry, I'm just updating my notes here. Uh, so the answer to the first question is yes. When we initially did present uh, the the tiered approach to council at the work session. Um, one of the reasons what, that we justified this approach was saying it's consistent with, with, with what Minneapolis is implementing and it's consistent with what St. Louis Park is planning to implement. So they were aware of that at the time that they um, directed us to look at a more uniform approach. Uh, at this time, um, Hopkins, Minnetonka, Eden Prairie, Bloomington, and Richfield uh, have not uh, really expressed um, strong plans to Okay. Uh, move forward with changing their speed limits. I think most of them are uh, kind of in a wait and see mode to see what some of the first ring suburbs do. Yeah, well, I was going to say, except for except for Richfield, they're all outer ring suburbs. Um, well, and the second the second question I have, uh, and I believe that I saw a number of comments in the in the public comments about um, whether or not Edina Police would have in no matter what we go to, will Edina police enforce the speed limits and will they have the capacity to do that? Um, I think it's probably, I, I'm all for lower speed limits. I don't know that those lower speed limits will actually be uh, what the practice is unless the police enforce it. So do you have any um, information about that? Sure, so um, in our, in our initial recommendation, which we reviewed with the police department before we presented it to the commission and to council, um, a concern, uh, one of the chief concerns that, oops, excuse me, one of the chief concerns that the police department had was enforcement along uh, some of the really high, high volume roadways where they, especially areas where they already see um, issues with speed compliance. So the frontage roads, um, Interlock and Olinger, uh, streets like that. Um, and that's part of the reason why we recommended a more modest change to their speed limits down to 25 or, or keeping them at 30. Um, the current recommendation still kind of maintains that makes in, in our view, it makes those streets easier to enforce because they either don't change much from what they are right now or, um, or they stay the same as what they are. Um, as far as enforcement, the, this, this approach is generally easier to enforce because Again, similar to how it's more confusing for, or it's more clear for the drivers to understand and remember what the speed limits are. It's easier for the police department to uh, to know what the speed limits are throughout the city, so they know, generally speaking, that it's 25 pretty much everywhere except for a handful of cases. So we, I'll get into it a little further in my presentation, but okay, sorry, um, we haven't. Uh, kind of a next step will be to talk more de in detail with the police department to. Okay. Develop a an, an enforcement strategy. Okay, okay. I you know I, I I did notice that several of the comments said they're not uh, the police is not the police department is not currently enforcing current speed limits, and so what you know how will what is the likelihood that they will now enforce the new ones? But hopefully, if there are strategies to be developed, uh, they will have a commitment to doing so. Question mark. <laughs> and well, and the the 
data from the traffic study that we that we uh, that we performed really shows that on the for the most part on the local system people are going to, are going 30 or less. So we really don't think that there's going to be a significant issue with or a significant need for enforcement on the local system because the majority of users tend to drive at or below the speed limit. Um, but you're right there there it's a different case when you get to the the collector streets. Um, mm -hmm. And there are certainly other strategies that we can uh, that we want to implement things like geometric changes or you know other other things that are consistent with the living streets or the pet and bike plan um, that will help to uh, help to drive behavior uh, in that way. Um, and France Avenue is not um, identified as any particular speed limit, and I know that it has several speed limits. Um, will that show up? Is there a plan for France in terms of speed limits? The county at this point has not uh, has not stated any expressed any uh, I don't want to say interest. They haven't expressed any intention to um, review speed limits on France. Okay. Thank you. So the this map only shows the local streets. It doesn't show county or state or private. Okay. I have one more question about the the public engagement. Sure. And that was, do you know how many different ways the city um, put out notices to try and drive people to Better Together Edina to gather that feedback? feedback? Sure. So we um, we issued a press release back in, I believe, early October when the site was published. We also put, um, we had two items in the Friday report um, to council to uh, encourage council members and everyone else who signed up for that report to uh, to go to the site. And, and, and the, like on next door or press releases, where do those go? I'm to be honest, I'm not certain if they if they necessarily go to if they're like specifically sent to news outlets or if it's just the city publishes them and then news outlets are somehow notified. I, I'd have to talk to communications about that. That's a good question. That, that would be a helpful thing to find out. Um, I tend to agree that um, this is a really small, <laughs> this is a small data, it's a data point. Um, and I think we could probably draw some reasonable conclusions from it, but, um, but it certainly isn't representative of um, all of Edina. That said, if uh, if press release goes to next door and it goes to Sun Current and it you know goes to the city's Facebook page, and I mean if it goes to a number of news outlets, um, then I think that's probably um, at least decent due diligence. If it doesn't, though, if it just goes on the city's web page or whatever, um, I think that's that's probably a, a problem. Sure, that's definitely something I can look into. Um, kind of getting back to, to where we were, unless there's any other questions at this point. Um, the, the third way that we received feedback was direct correspondence, um, either to staff or in some cases they were directly to city council um, or they were to city council through the correspondence submission form online. Uh, so we received 19 uh, emails or items of correspondence in that manner. Uh, four of them were supportive of the current recommendation. Six were supportive of 20 mile an hour limits. Three were unsupportive. And then six, again, were in that other, other category where they were more asking specific questions or um, sharing specific observations. Andrew. Yes. Sorry. Just a quick question here. Is there a threshold for the participation for the population to participate in order to even bring a, like, let's say you have to meet a 1% or 2% of the populations to be able to even move a project forward like this? Is there a threshold? Good question. We don't have any kind of threshold like that. We just, we present at this point, we present the numbers as we get them and leave it up to city council to make that determination whether or not they think the 
um, results warrant moving forward or, or whether or not we should go back and try again. Okay. So this number 131, probably about 0.2%, right, of the population? Uh, I don't know offhand. I guess it depends on what population number you're basing it off of. Okay. But it is. I just Googled it. There's 52,000, as of 2018, 52,000 people in Iran. So it's to like 0.249 then. And am I wrong in in understanding that it's 131 on the feedback form, 36 on the map, and 19 by direct correspondence? So it's the combination of those three. Well, and some of them did multiple. Right? So some. So okay. if I go back to this slide, um, 138 people or users in total. Okay. Either either completed the feedback form or did the map or did both. Okay. So it's really, I'd say it's just 138, and I mean, there could be some overlap with these 19 as well. Some okay. people who completed the forms on Better Together may also have submitted direct correspondence. Okay, so 0.249%. Okay, thank you. Sure. So based on the, the feedback that we've received, staff uh, still recommends proceeding with this uniform approach. Um, we feel that it's most appropriate for Edina for uh, a few reasons. One, as I mentioned before, it sets consistent expectations for our users. Um, it's less expensive to implement um, in terms of signage. Um, we don't have we don't have the definitive or an estimate for the signage costs right now um, because we want to make sure that council is comfortable with this approach before we dive into it too deep. Given that we've already presented them with one other approach. Uh, uh, earlier this year. Um, and then the other reason that we feel that this approach is appropriate for Edina is because it's easy to communicate to the public. Um, it's easier to get the message out. There's a default, all streets, uh, speeds on the street are 25 miles an hour unless that they're, unless they're signed otherwise. Um, as I mentioned before, there's, there's other things in addition to the speed limits that the city plans to do to kind of achieve these safety goals. Um, and it's important to note that this is really just one approach in a comprehensive, uh, a, this is one strategy in a comprehensive approach to address public safety. Um, so in addition to lowering these streets, the city would continue to implement the living streets minimum roadway widths, which we've seen have an impact on uh, vehicle speeds. Um, we would still be implementing infrastructure that's recommended in the Pet and Bike Master Plan. Um, as well as other initiatives like our open streets events, our bike to work day event, public education campaigns, all of those are kind of components uh, of this tiered approach or of this comprehensive approach. Andrew, can I ask a question real quick? Before, sure. Uh, so, so when you say staff recommends, does that mean you? Who is staff? Can you define that for us? Who makes up that group of people or is sure. it a person or person? Sure, good question. So in this context, this report is coming from the engineering department. So it's specifically coming from the from the from me and from uh, director Chad Milner. So it's engineering department that's recommending uh, proceeding with this recommendation. But but what was the catalyst? What was the catalyst that said, I mean, you recommended because of, of these things, but what was the reason to address it? Was it because it's now something we can do, so why not do it? Or was there uh, a rash of, you know, hit and runs or people getting hit on this? I mean, well, there must have been some catalyst to this. What, what was the catalyst? Sure, good question. So back in uh, August of 2019, the state legislature passed, um, passed a law that said that gave cities the authority to set their own local speed limits. Um, it's a, a an authority that the city has long advocated for, um, the ability to, to set their own local speed limits without having to go through a, a, a lengthy traffic study process. Um, so that was passed, and following that, um, the city of Minneapolis and the city of St. Uh, St. Paul very quickly, um, or relatively quickly, um, developed a plan to implement that uh, on their own streets, and we had um, several council members who were very interested in applying that same 
using that same authority uh, in Edina, given that we'd been pushing for it for a long time. So really the, the catalyst was that legislation that was passed that gave us the authority to do this. But there really wasn't a problem. There wasn't, there, there, there wasn't a, uh, like a report that said, oh my God, we've got a, out of control drivers that are jeopardizing the safety. There, there wasn't really a safety issue that it was something that you'd like to be able to do or somebody said they'd like to do at some point, correct? Peter, I can speak to that because well, um, though I answer, don't have so a, asking, yeah. a ton of years on the, on the commission, I now am almost four years on the commission and having also been part of the bike task force at one point, I can say that um, there's been a desire um, by many in the public to reduce the speed limits on particularly the local streets in Edina for years. So some of us believe there have been problems uh, for a long time. So well, that'd be great that if there wasn't any crop. But and, and I think that the report that was included in our packet, uh, Andrew summarized many of the, those many instances of where this has been pursued over the years kind of the history of wanting to lower speed limits. But again, I, I guess, so let me, okay, that's fine. Um, I mean, again, I, I still haven't heard a catalyst like a safety problem or some, this seems to be a solution in search of a problem. Like there, I'm not aware of a problem that I, I mean, I just want to, before I would make a recommendation or approve it, I'd want to know what the problem we're trying to solve is because I haven't heard that yet. Yeah, yeah. Now maybe it's coming, but I haven't heard a specific problem that we're solving other than we can now do it, so we're doing it, which to me seems a little bit foolhardy given that we're spending money to solve a problem that we don't actually have right now, other than people would like to do it. I mean, liking to do something and having a reason to do it or a problem are two different things. I, I think what Mindy was saying and what I was trying to say is that uh that there has been an agreement that at least by a, a number of members of the commission over the over many years uh, and the public that that there is a problem with the speed of traffic in the city of Edina that it's unsafe generally is there an incident no I think there are many incidents uh, so I, I think the problem is the the current speed by which vehicles travel our streets is too fast and creates a safety problem, particularly for pedestrians and bicycles, and also uh, causes more damage when there are crashes than we need to have. I think that's the problem. I guess I, I would also add that I see this as a way to achieve, um, a way to achieve goals that we've identified in guiding documents. So these, this supports safety goals that we have in the comprehensive plan, in the living streets plan, in the pet and bike master plan. Um, the, the latter two were, or the, the comp plan and the pet and bike master plan both were uh, very recent. Um, so it, to your point about there not necessarily being one specific instance or one specific problem that we're trying to address, it's more the, the city's way of thinking has changed in recent years and that we're trying to become more multimodal friendly and more supportive of people walking and biking and, and taking other modes of transportation other than vehicles. And we feel that this uh, changing speed limits in addition to things like narrowing the roadways and putting in more pet and bike infrastructure helps support those goals. Which, you know, first of all, I agree with this pedestrian bike plan, but to me, we're going at wrong order this this should be the last step the speed should be the last step after we've implemented it i also think the money which i, I know you're saying you're not able to even quantify i would rather see that added to more sidewalks i'd rather see that added to creating bike lanes before we something implement something that may or may not even make a difference I mean, there's no evidence that you've shown that, that, that I've seen or read that, that says this is gonna actually make any difference. Yeah, it seems like it would, it sounds like it would, but I actually see tons of bikers on the roads, more, more than I've seen in my lifetime in the last few years. They're everywhere. And people out walking right now, it's, it's nuts. 
I mean, obviously part of that's because of COVID, but but I mean, I, Peter, I mean, I would rather. Peter, let me, let me let me just stop you and ask if you read the report that Andrew wrote, because the evidence exists that no, this doesn't make a difference. No, no, it doesn't. It, it, it re references other cities. It, it doesn't reference a place like Edina at all. It references larger cities, other communities. I mean, it, it doesn't have a comparison, and we don't have any data, significant data that says there's a problem. If there was, someone would have said, oh, well, the reason is, is because look at all these horrific accidents we've had where bikers have been taken out. That would be much easier than referencing. We wouldn't even need references of cities that don't, that don't even compare with China. I mean, look, I'm in favor of this, but I feel like this process is like we're, we're changing the speed limit before we even figured out the, the we've imp implemented this pedestrian bike plan. And by the way, we're going to spend a whole bunch of money on this that may or may not make a difference. And that's gonna come out of the pocket of these other projects. I'd rather see more sidewalks and, 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 and bike paths and things like that that make a difference right away than changing a bunch of signs that may or may not have a difference. I mean, I mean maybe afterwards. Okay. And I'll, I'll give you one real example. Okay. That street, that 58th street that just got done, right? The one that's got done, where you guys narrowed the street. Is it 58th street? Is that the one? Yep, 58th street. Yeah. When you drive down 58th Street now from France Avenue to Wood, Wooddale, you, you go slower. You, you go slower. I don't even know what the speed limit is. I don't, you know, I'm 53 years old. I, I don't w look at street speed signs very much because I just know the flow of the traffic. You kind of feel it. I don't, I'm not constantly looking for signs. Most people, by this time, you get used to kind of knowing what to drive. That street design makes me want to slow down. You know what I mean? Does is anyone else driven down that street? Don't you agree? It makes you, it, it, it's the way it's designed. Well, let's get that stuff done. Figure out, to me, that that's the order of this. This seems to be way out of order. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. And so that, sorry. Peter, so that's Peter I'd, like, I'd like for us to move on. Do you feel that you have made your point? Yep. Okay. Let's Let's keep moving on. Uh, I guess one one more thing that I would add is that in the I believe it's included in that technical report, but the quality of life survey that we that we uh, send out every two every two years um, for the last five or so years now I think maybe seven years, um, but there's consistently been a question about how do you feel about um, traffic and speed in your neighborhood, and very consistently um, people identify speed in their neighborhoods as an issue. So I be I th and think in the range of like forty percent. So um, we feel that that's a significant portion of the population that's identified an issue. Oh, Andrew, you should include that in your. Um, it's not public engagement specific to this, but I think you that's data that will be helpful in your report. Hey, I, I'd like to add something. Uh, when this first came up, I did a little reading on the the science behind speed and traffic uh, injury and things like that. Um, it was convincing to me, not just from the National Transportation Safety Board, but also some studies from Canada that the chance of death or serious injury in a motor vehicle accident uh, starts increasing at around 20 miles per hour and then rises you know, pretty, pretty steadily from there. So I think there's a good science base for lowering the speed limit. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so, going on to kind of what the next steps in this process are. So, um, I want to incorporate the comments from the from the commission uh, in my report, and then present the present just the engagement report to city council in January. Um, so, again, the the reason for that is because we've already presented them with one option that they've told us to to retweak and revise. So, I I want to get their uh, kind of stamp of approval on this updated plan before we really dive deep into implementation. So in January, what I would be asking them to do is to confirm staff's recommendation and authorize us to proceed with the implementation plan. Uh, developing the implementation plan is going to be a, a multi-department effort. Um, public Works will be involved to uh, help us determine the extent that signage will need to be replaced and traffic signals would need to be modified. Uh, like I mentioned before, we'll work with the police department to develop an enforcement strategy that works for them. Uh, we'll work with our communications department to develop a public education strategy. Uh, and then uh, 
engineering will also look at an evaluation strategy similar to what Minneapolis had. So what are what are our metrics to determine success for this? Um, and what opportunities might we have to make changes uh, in the future if this is implemented? So with that, I'll stand for any other questions the commission might have. Hi, Andrew, I have one. I had to switch audio first, can I ask, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Uh, when I was looking at those benefits on that slide that was presented about uniformity and uh, less expensive and easier to communicate, I was trying, trying to compare, compare that to the previous uh, proposal that was 20 miles per hour as a more basis. And I couldn't, um, well, I, you explained part of it already, but the neighboring communities seems like a, a gap that's not being addressed for St. Louis Park and Minneapolis being 20. Sorry. Sorry, Kirk, if I could interrupt you for a second. Your audio is coming in twice. Are you on two different devices? Uh, well, I th you explained yeah. part of it already, but... Kirk, can you hear me? Just nod if you can hear. <laughs> Anyone? I can hear you. Okay. Kirk, can you hear us? Me too. Kirk, I think you signed in twice. And we were the only one. He just said sorry in the chat. Uh. And Andrew, I think you can mute one of his connections if it happens again. See, I only see him on once right now. Yeah, same. Kirk, can you hear us? Everybody else is good? So, Andrew, while we're waiting for this to start out, you, you said questions. I, I don't really have any other questions. What else are you looking for from us at this point? Feedback. Um, it doesn't, yeah, I'm sorry. It doesn't necessarily have to be questions. Any other, um, any other comments, suggestions, recommendations you have uh, are welcome. I mean, I mean, again, the report, I, I found my notes here uh, on the actual report after going over it. And I mean, it seems like much of the report is based on like New York City, Boston, Seattle, like I said, other large urban areas, which I don't think really apply. Um, there's a point where it mentions um, bike and pedestrian safety. There's no data um, on the number of incidents on minor roads, none. So this is, you're basically, um, it says accidents involving pedestrians or cyclists were relatively rare, less than 10%. The greatest concentration of these is in the South Eastern quadrant. These are actually data from Edina. So that I, 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 you know, there was information there, but, but almost no data on these side streets. And again, I'm not against doing this. I just feel like the process is out of order. I mean, this is that that's my biggest concern. I, I think the, um, and, and that's number one. And then the other concern is, is George Floyd. George Floyd has changed this whole thing. Edina is known. I mean, I'm surprised that people think that they're aggressive or they were aggressive before George Floyd incident um, at, at, at pulling people over and, be, and making stops. I mean, they're aggressive, not only on 100, but all over Edina. And if, this, if they're not going to enforce it because they can't or don't want to or it's such a high risk maneuver. It also seems uh, to be a mistake. So that's my other, I mean, right now, I'm not saying never, but to me, it seems like if there was a glaring problem, I think you would have had a heck of a lot more people than 138 people uh, give you feedback 
And I, and I think that the odds of Edina enforcing this right now is slim and none. And to me to put this, the timing of this is, 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 it's just not, it doesn't make any sense. So that's it. That's my last thought. So uh, Andrew. Yes. I, I, myself also, I do have uh, concerns about this. It's a great initiative, but if you would have parsed it, like we say, if St. Louis Park has already adopted it, St. Minneapolis did adopt, those adjacent suite or entries would match the speed limit on those areas. I think that's okay, but just going to change it, not knowing how much we're gonna be spending, because the first thing you would look at is, is the budget, right? Knowing the issues we have with the gas taxes, not having a lot of income coming in to the cities because of gas taxes going down and different things, we would probably have to have something extremely solid to be able to push this through. It's not, I mean, I like the road diets to be able to control because that's kind of a Kanban. You're basically putting something in, even if you wanna uh, not do it, you are obligated to do it. So redirecting that money would be great, unless if the money is not a lot and we see it, we know the money, we don't even know yet how much we're gonna be spending. I know you cannot forecast that, but even if you get a benchmark, of how much we spent so far on the speed limit signs, 30, 30 miles an hour, for instance, would be a good help to really have a full picture. But I mean, even when, I'm sorry, what, when you brought up the fact of the, of the public works and all these other departments, it's gonna be in the millions of dollars. I mean, there's no way, you, it's gotta be millions of dollars. I mean, not like tens of millions, but several million dollars. I mean, you guys can't do it, I mean, not you, like it's a problem, but it's it's impossible to do almost anything without spending millions of dollars. And so if it's 10 grand, no big deal, but it's gotta be, maybe someone else knows, I don't know, but it can't be, it's not, it's expensive. Peter, let, let's let Bokar finish what he wants to say, please. Because what I was thinking, maybe we just take a portion of it for all the adjacent cities where their speed limit has changed we match those, so we, we do an increment change, incremental change. That's what I would suggest for this, Andrew, because it's just hard for the tax, um, for the taxpayer to validate this. And then when we look at the data, although it's 131 participant, but this is very valid data, it's about 0.0249% of the population who responded. So it's just hard, but yes, safety is number one. We wanted to, to, to do things right, but let's just start with the outskirts, for instance. Sure, I appreciate that feedback. One just kind of correction, Many, well, Minneapolis has approved and has implemented their changes. St. Louis Park hasn't yet. Um, they're just, they're looking at it, but uh, they're not going to their city council until late January. Hey, I want to uh, put my two cents in. I worry a lot about um, confusion and differential enforcement. That was probably my biggest objection to the 20 is plenty idea. I think that risk is mitigated a little bit with the lowering to just 25. The best solution really is to do something like Michigan does, where all unmarked residential streets are 25. That'd be the ideal solution. Um, but I think this is a I think this is appropriate and balances the risks uh, versus the benefits. And uh, the cost, uh, I, I don't know, was that in the report? What specifically will be the cost to implement this? So the um, costs are not included in the report right now. They'd be part of the implementation plan, but um, some examples of what the cost would include, um, a, a, primary, a primary one would be uh, material and labor to replace existing signs or put up new signs where they're where they're required. Um, there's certain requirements that the, um, the legislation itself has that requires us to to meet. We have to make sure that the limits are um, consistent and that they're they're communicated in a way that's that can be understood. Um, so we'll be looking like, for example, we'll be looking at what city city of Minneapolis has done 
for their signage plan as kind of a, a reference point. Um, the the public engagement side of it will have some costs associated with that, depending on what kind of approach we take. Um, Minneapolis, for example, has said one of their one of the biggest um, tools, one of the most effective tools they use to communicate the message were the, the blue yard signs uh, that said 20 is plenty. You may have, I, I saw them all over Minneapolis, um, but apparently they were, they were very popular um, and they, they went really quickly and I don't know what the, how many of them they printed or what the cost for those were, but um, something like that would be an example of a communication strategy. Um, and then there's, uh, of course, there's staff time involved in, you know, preparing all of these and, and implementing it. Andrew, did the city of Minneapolis publish their costs? What did they, what it cost them? Do we have, do you know what that is? Could you find out? I don't know, but I could, I could look into that. I mean, that would be, I mean, obviously it's a much larger city, but it'd be interesting to hear what the ballpark of, of what it, you know, might be. Sure. Their costs will also be, I mean, there's kind of two things that'll differentiate their costs from ours. One being they had a tiered approach compared to if we go forward with this one, that's inherently different for signage requirements, but then also because they are a much larger city with many more streets. But yeah, I can certainly look into that. Andrew, if, if uh, the, the not going a tiered approach is the preferred um, system, is there any reason why we wouldn't go to 20 as the default? As opposed to 25 since 20. So Bruce has brought up the science, the body science, I think. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we certainly have read your report and read the materials available. Um, and there's a reason why Minneapolis went to 20 and a reason why St. Louis Park is going to 20. So could it be a, a non-tiered approach where 20 is the default? I, I'm not aware of any city that's gone to a 20 default approach. Um, the kind of the national guidance, specifically the National Association for City Transportation Officials or NACTO, um, they've kind of issued, and I believe some of their um, information I've quoted in my report. Um, but they've so there's there's generally there's two different approaches. There's the what we call a tiered approach, which is what we originally looked at, which is what Minneapolis did, where you have some at 30, some at 25, some at you know vast majority at 20. Um, and then there's the uniform approach, which is what we're kind of referring to this this current recommendation, where you have a blanket default limit for the whole city with maybe a few exceptions. Um, generally, NACTO has recommended going to a slightly higher limit, going to 25, when you're implementing a uniform speed limit uh, as a way to balance the safety of users, but also the the mobility of your users because you're applying it not only to residential streets, but you're applying it to your collectors and to potentially your uh, arterials. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's a compromise point. Okay. I'm interested if any of our student commissioners have thoughts about this. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, Peter brings up a lot of points about the speed limits, but I think just overall that we should just keep the current plan that the city council is going with, because I feel like, I mean, even though I see those 20 is plenty signs in the yards, I, when I'm driving with my mom, I, I feel like, I don't know. It just seems like one of those, like kids live here, drive slow signs, you know? So I don't know how effective those be in the community. So, Anna, are you saying you you like the uh, the uniform approach at twenty five as the default? Yeah, I I would say that it, that would be the one that I would prefer. Okay, thank you, Anand Nihar. Either of you? I actually had a question, um, Andrew, about the tier approach. So, would that just be a? Um, I think you had said earlier, be like twenty five, twenty, fifteen, and ten. Yeah, I can go back here to. The slide to show it a little better. So this this is the this would be what a tiered approach would look like. Oh, okay. Where in a sense, you have in a sense you have a default limit of 20, 20 miles an hour on, but that really primarily applies to your local residential streets, your low volume streets. Once you get up 
a, a category of class of roadway classification, um, then the speed limit increases to 25 as a way to encourage or promote the mobility on those higher traffic roadways. And then some are even higher than that at 30. Okay. So, well, then, personally, I would, I, I agree with the uniform approach to keep it simple and um, same across to all um, roads to, to make it, I, I guess, for drivers and even the police officers, officers as you said, like easy to understand and like know, um, oh, um, if I'm going here, it's going to be 25 and I'm going here, it's going to be 15 or 20. So that's my take on it. Sure, Andrew, what's you. our current approach? Would it be called the one right now? If nothing changed, would it be a tier or would it be a whatever you, the other term? I would cat the way the speed limits are right now. I would categorize as a uniform approach, where oh. the, the vast the vast majority of our local streets are thirty miles an hour, and we have a handful of exceptions. We uh, not not including the school zones. We have some streets that are twenty five because they have bike lanes on them, and we have some that are thirty or forty. Um, because they're either frontage roads or they're bordered with other jurisdictions. Good question. Um, Kirk, I, do you want to, I, I wanted to get your, your questions. I just couldn't hear you because you had, there were, your audio was coming in twice. Would you be willing to, to restate your, your questions or comments? I don't know what happened to Kirk. He's here, just can't hear him. Oh, his microphone's not on. He doesn't have it. That's what's wrong. Or connected. It's not connected. Well, how about um, how about if we move along? And um, if Kirk is Kirk, is that you? Okay. Um, and if uh, Kirk is able to get his audio working, he can um, he can join in at I guess um, commission commissioner comments. Commission. Yeah, either that or either that or I can try to connect with him offline okay. to to answer his comments, answer his questions. Okay. Sounds good. Do you have what you need, Andrew? Uh, yes, unless there's any other comments, input that other commissioners want to provide or any other questions that anyone wants to ask. I think I just want to reiterate the concern about um, the amount of public input, that it's that number still seems low and especially Considering the pandemic, I want to make sure that people have more opportunity to provide feedback on this, that that might have. I think with all the various objections that we have had, if there were more public feedback, um, it might make me have a feeling one way or the other around the different things where we've expressed concern. I, I think that's a good point. Uh, I was th sitting here thinking. Yeah, that's a tiny number. And I was thinking, well, what could we do to get more uh, public engagement? Um, and I'm not sure what it is. Andrew, was this uh, a lot of people look at next door where they're sort of like advertisements, if you will, on next door about going to the survey? Uh, good question. Mindy asked that question too. I, I'm not certain, um, but I can check with our um, community engagement staff to see if there was any or with communications to see if there was any post on next door. Uh, so that I, might be something because that we could, maybe there's things that we could do and we do this again um, to boost it. Cause yeah, uh, a more representative sample would have been, would have been nice. I, I do think that, um, you know, you get, you get a, a very small sample when you ask for engagement, but if you have history over years of people saying what they want is slower speeds in their neighborhoods or on their streets, um, I think you've got more data than just the engagement piece that you did as a result of this. Um, yeah, and and then, you know, yes, you have a small sample size, 
people tend not to join in on an issue if they don't feel strongly one way or the other. Um, and that may be the case. Again, it's hard to, hard to make some assumptions about this one. Yeah, it's after the fact. Just wait till we implement it, and then everyone will be all over it. <laughs> That's always the case, right? Right. Well, again, going if I can go back to the engagement statistics, so uh, 138 people provided feedback in some manner, more or less, and not counting the ones who may have only submitted direct correspondence, but there were a thousand people who came to the site. I mean, not saying a thousand is representative of the city either, um, but there, you know, there, there. I don't know how much of this uh, these people who visited the site but didn't leave a comment, you know, what does that say about whether or not they were supportive or not of what the city is proposing? I just, I guess I just would pose that general question. But without knowing where these people live, I mean, it could have been the sign manufacturer's staff. Went on. I mean, I mean this, besides Again, the Sam's, hard to the make Sam's we don't know. What? Again, it's hard to make assumptions. Mm -hmm. I can't remember when I signed up for Better Together if it asked for my address. If there's any way of knowing I, I where ask for your users. Email. I don't believe it does. I believe it just asks for an email. Yep. Okay, Andrew. Great. Thank you. I think uh I think maybe the next topic is is that the TDM? Sure is. All right. One you've all been waiting for. <laughs> all right, let me just shift gears in my notes here. All right. So uh, I'll um, briefly go over kind of what the comprehensive plan guiding language is related to TDM. Um, mention the commission's recommendation from uh, late last year. Um, what uh, council's feedback was at the work session and then how uh, ETC's recommendation and council feedback has uh, kind of fed into what staff is currently recommending. Uh, so goal number five of the transportation portion of the comp plan is to promote a travel demand management program through a coordinated program of regulations, marketing, and provision of alternative workplace and travel options. Uh, the primary emphasis of, of travel demand management or TDM uh, as stated in the plan, is to reduce the number of vehicles on congested roadways during peak travel times. And some of the strategies that are specifically mentioned to implement or that support TDM include pedestrian and bicycle facilities, transit facilities, uh, car, van pooling, shared mobility, and then telecommuting or flex time, which the last latter of which I assume most of us are familiar with at this point. Um, Kind of briefly recapping the, the commission's recommendation from late last year. Um, so the, the commission recommended kind of two tiers of, of application, um, tier one and tier two, depending on the development sides. And I'll, I'll get into those a little bit more specifically later on. Um, some of the other requirements were that the, the study be prepared by a qualified traffic consultant, um, that the uh, that the plan include a three-year TDM plan that has goals, strategies, evaluation measures, and proposed expenditures to implement TDM strategies. And then a TDM plan, it also called for a TDM plan agreement, uh, which in, would be filed with the, uh, with the city attorney. The ETC's recommendation was also for a financial guarantee on the part of the developer or the applicant for the project uh, in the amount of $100 per parking space for a new development or $100 per added parking space in the case of a redevelopment. The ETC recommended uh, that the administration fall under the fall to the community development director um, or their designee. And then as a method of compliance, the commission recommended an annual status report be submitted to the city every three years uh, with the option that if the TDM measures are not being met uh, as determined by staff, um, that the financial guarantee could be forfeited to the PACS fund um, for failure to comply. So this recommendation was presented to City Council at a work session. I, the date was actually April 7th, not 17th. I apologize. Um, some of the comments that were shared at this time 
Um, there were concerns from council about the financial guarantee. Um, this is a quote that was I took from the from the work session, but um, members of council specifically stated that they would prefer a, a carrot to a stick approach, um, which I took to mean that they would prefer um, ways to incentivize developers to implement TDM rather than uh, penalize them for not complying with TDM requirements. Um, they also asked, there was discussion about what other cities are doing. Um, as the, the comp plan notes, Minneapolis and Bloomington both have TDM ordinances. Um, there was, it was noted that developers are becoming more accustomed to um, implementing TDM or including TDM strategies in their proposals. Um, a recent example I can give, excuse me, would be if the commission recalls the traffic study for 7001 France, um, it included, uh, it noted that um, some parking stalls would be dedicated to our car, which is a shared mobility service. So that's an example of a developer on their own implement or uh, uh, proposing a TDM strategy. Um, there was discussion about what constitutes a good TDM plan. Um, some cities provide recommended strategies that they want developers to pick and choose from. Um, some, like the city of San Francisco, has a, a point system where different strategies are assigned different point values, and they so developers kind of have a, a menu of options to choose from, and then it's up to the city to figure out how many points that they need to attain based on the size of their development. Um, it's noted that those kind of standards have changed and, and likely will continue to change over time. Um, and finally, there was discussion about whether or not the city should look to implement TDM as part of a policy or as an ordinance. Uh, and the general conclusion of that discussion was that the, pol the policy would be easier to amend uh, at a staff level and the policy can be upgraded to an ordinance uh, in some form uh, in the future if, if staff recommends or commission recommends or if council decides that that's the appropriate way to go. Um, it was also noted that most cities that implement TDM start with a policy and then eventually work their way up to an ordinance. So I'll go into kind of some more detail now as to the current draft recommendation. Um, as far as the levels of applicability, uh, it's consistent with what the commission has recommended. So there's two tiers based on the size of the development. So tier one would be required if there's 50 or more residential units, there's 100 or more parking stalls required. Um, if the applicant is seeking flexibility from the required parking, so if they're seeking a parking variance, um, or if it's required by the city as a condition by the city council. So some examples of recent local developments that would fall under this category would be 7001 France, uh, 4500 France, and 7075 Obmanson. On the right, you have the tier two plan, which is required for 10 or more residential units, uh, 20 or more parking stalls required, if the proposed project has a, a floor area of more than 5,000 square feet, um, again, or as recommended by council condition. So some example local projects that would fall under this category would be Shake Shack um, 5000 Vernon, which is the uh, Caribou Coffee and Einstein Burgers, Einstein, sorry, Freudian slip, um, or the uh, Edina Flats project. Um, one thing to note, that I think is, is worth noting about this, uh, both the ETC's recommendation and what staff is recommending is that they apply to all development projects regardless of land use. So they apply to residential and commercial uh, and mixed use. Um, most TDM plans or policies that you see are specific to um, non-residential developments. Uh, and I think applying it to residential is um, equally important. Um, Going into what uh, the requirements of those plans are, it's, it's similar to what the ETC has recommended. Um, both Tier 1 and Tier 2 plans would require identification of strategies, implementation measures, and uh, a timeline for implementing. Um, I think one thing that I've, I've added as kind of a way to, to quantify the, um, the level of TDM that they've implemented is I'm recommending that for Tier 1 plans that they identify 
at a minimum five unique strategies that they're planning to implement. On the tier two side, I'm recommending that they identify at least three strategies that they're planning to implement. Um, both plans would require them to identify proposed expenditures to implement their TDM strategies. On the tier one side, then they would also have to include their anticipated single occupancy vehicle reduction and then um, their proposed evaluation measures and ways for them to track how effective that their, their measures are. Um, some differences to what ETC has recommended. There's no um, three year plan or agreement uh, included and their uh, financial guarantee um, is currently not part of the recommendation for the reasons that I mentioned coming out of the work session with city council. Andrew, what's the anticipate? What was that? What is that again? SOV? What is that? Uh, sorry, SOV is single occupancy vehicle. So like a motorcycle? No, so it's a, a motor vehicle that has only one person in it. But can you explain this provision of it? I don't understand. What, what's the provision? So, sure. So, um, like I mentioned before, TDM is generally targeted at trying to reduce the number of vehicles that are on the, on the on the roads, particularly during the peak hours, times when the roadways are really congested. And data has consistently showed that the majority of trips are from single occupancy vehicles or from people getting in their car by themselves and going, running errands, going to work, um, whatever it is. So the single occupancy vehicle trip reduction is kind of a, a standard measure for how successful a, uh, a TDM plan is. Does that, does that answer your question, Peter? Yeah, I mean, it's, this sounds like something that Minneapolis has already done or is in the process of doing, is that right? Minneapolis does, they have a TDM ordinance. But I mean, also this, whatever this SOV, I mean, they've been actively trying to discourage driving, basically. Is that sort of what this is sort of promoting? As well. Yes, I guess, uh, admittedly, I'm not familiar with the specific requirements beyond what's in the ordinance language for what, what Minneapolis um, looks for in their TDM plans. But generally speaking, yes, any agency that's promoting TDM is looking to, um, I don't necessarily know if I would say discourage, well, uh, to a certain extent, yes, discourage um, motor vehicle travel, but more to encourage other transportation usage or um, that transportation usage be kind of more balanced out throughout the system rather than having these huge peaks in the morning and huge peaks in the afternoon. So that's kind of where things like telecommuting or, or uh, flex time schedules come into play. Does that answer? Sorry, I was shaking my head. I didn't realize that my video was off, sorry. Yes. Oh, that's yeah. okay. So kind of talking about the some examples, so I mentioned that the plans would require a certain number of strategies to be identified. These are just kind of some example strategies um, broken into kind of four categories. So on the active transportation side, um, this would be things like internal or external walkways and bikeways, uh, bike repair stations, bike lockers, indoor storage, commuter showers, wayfinding signage, two pet and bike infrastructure, and in the ride sharing category, excuse me, um, including priority carpool parking stalls, um, subsidizing use or otherwise encouraging bike share, scooter share, car share, like the, the our car example that I, that I gave earlier. Um, there's transit TDM strategies, um, developments that locate near existing services um, are generally, are often referred to as transit oriented development or TOD um, developments can include enhanced bus shelters or amenities if they're adjacent to transit services. Um, some provide their own private shuttle services to groceries, amenities, kind of similar to the Cloveride service the city offers. Um, developments can subsidize transit passes to either their employees or to their tenants, um, and also including wayfinding signage to adjacent transit facilities. Um, the telecommuting side is, I think, a little more difficult for the city to enforce, but some, it does fall under the category of TDM and 
Some of those strategies include implementing alternative work schedules, so flex time, staggered hours for employees, um, and providing telecommuting resources and technology for uh, for employees. Um, one thing I'll note here, in my opinion, that these of the potential strategies, my vision is that they would exclude anything that's already currently required by the city. Um, so if a development is adjacent to, say, a segment of roadway where the ped and bike plan recommends putting in a sidewalk, um, that piece of infrastructure, in my opinion, wouldn't count as a TDM strategy in this because the city's already recommended it. So the developer would have to do something in addition to that. An example would be a system of internal or external uh, walkways or trails that connect to that facility or that connect to other adjacent developments. That to me would be an example of a, a valid TDM strategy. Another example I and, would say- Could I ask about that? Um, what yeah. if the developer um, offered to pay for that section of bike and pedestrian infrastructure? Because wouldn't that allow us to use the PAX fund on other areas? Generally they do. In 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 locations where we, um, where we require them to fill in the network gap um, that's paid for by the developer. So then I, I would think that would be a great strategy to accept. I, maybe I'm wrong. And Bruce and Kirk, you guys should weigh in on that. These, these are just examples, I think, to get people's ideas going. Okay. This is not a complete list, right, okay. Andrew? Right. But I, I, I would be interested to hear the commission's thoughts on, because that is the, that is kind of the direction that I'm thinking of going with this. Uh, another example would be bike racks. We have, there's a certain number of bike racks that are required by our city ordinance, 5% of the parking that you're providing. If a developer provides bike racks in accordance with that ordinance, I would say that's not a TDM strategy because they're just doing what they're already required to do. If they were to install something more than what's required, that then I, I would consider a TDM strategy. If we're requiring them to put in five bike racks and they install 10 bike racks, um, depending on what kind of development it is, I could see that as being an effective strategy. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, what I'm saying is that if the city has plans to include a bike and pedestrian walkway are you saying uh that if it it's a requirement for them to do that pedestrian bike and pedestrian walkway then it wouldn't be included in the uh, as a tdm strategy do, I mean, we, do we ever require them in the development to do, put in to put that in we have uh in we have in in previous instances i'd say it's more okay. common that we it's more common generally speaking that we require them to um maintain or or replace something that's there right now so a sidewalk that's adjacent to them in the right of way um sometimes they want to you know move it from the back of curb or sometimes they want to widen it or add some you know pedestrian or other amenities to it um we're fine with that but as as you know we want them to if there's a sidewalk there Right now, we want there to be a sidewalk, at least a sidewalk when the project's done, if not something that's maybe a right. step further. Right. If there's okay. no sidewalk there right now, and say the plan calls for a sidewalk, um, we would we would either require that they construct it themselves as part of the project, or that they give the city easements so that we can construct it at some point in the future. And some developments choose to build it themselves, some choose to... Um, give the city the, the easement to build it themselves. So, so that's the one where it would make sense to me that uh, if they chose to build it themselves, that that would be, that would be one of their TDM strategies. Because they're saving the city the expense of doing it and they're putting it in probably well ahead of the plan. Um, sure. see, that's, I, that's a good point. If I read this correctly though, it's to, the, the, if they're required, like there is a bike rack ordinance in Edina. And so if they're already required to do it, that's, that's, that's doesn't agree. count as one of their five. Yeah. Yes, completely agree. But if there's anything that is a nice to have or something, they, they should be able to count that. Yeah. yeah. Correct. So, so this is for both residential and commercial, correct? Correct. So 
you know, essentially though, these, um, I think they're great ideas. I, I think I'm supportive of them, but that adds cost to a project, doesn't it? I mean, they're, they're essentially, this will add things that a developer will need to um, spend money on. And I guess the the, cost, the effect of that is that that kind of hurts the other side of the balance sheet as it relates to uh, equity and diversity, because now we're gonna be um, driving up the cost of of projects to you know for example a, a residence or an apartment or something that that has to go into the cost of 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 the project and I, I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad idea i'm just saying that seems like it works if we're going to expect um developers to go above and beyond that's got money's got to come from somewhere and that may mean that we're eliminating eliminating the ability for people that we want to allow access to live here, they may not be able to afford it then. I mean, what's have you guys dealt with that or addressed them? I mean, these sound like expensive things to add to a building, I mean. Some of these options really don't cost much money, if any at all, but you're right, Peter, some are quite expensive, but there's plenty of examples that don't necessarily cost money. And many right. of the and developments in Edina are, are, are already too expensive for lower income people. That's why there's a, you know, uh, affordable housing component in more, many of the projects that have been approved lately. And I, I guess I, it's a good comment, Peter. And like I mentioned, that was something that was discussed at the work session. And that was kind of a reason why staff at this point is not suggesting to include the financial guarantee. Um, but like I also mentioned, there's there's several developments that are already including some of these uh, strategies because that's the way that the, the market is going. People want um, to have bike repair stations. They want to have, um, you know, car sharing opportunities or, or shared mobility opportunities. So I think it's kind of finding that balance point between um, wanting to kind of encourage or support the way that the market is going, but also support the 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 um, kind of the traffic reduction goals that we're trying to achieve. That reminds me of my question um, when the council suggested a carrot rather than stick approach. What what are the carrots that they're suggesting? I understand the not wanting the financial penalty um, is the reward to developers for following or for implementing maybe more of the TDM strategies than might be required of them, or even for implementing the basic level that we're asking for that's that's a good question and to be honest i kind of struggle with what exactly that that carrot should look like or if if a carrot should be uh should be added right now this what i've kind of recommended doesn't necessarily have a carrot but it also doesn't really have a stick i mean it has some it doesn't have as hard of a stick as like a financial guarantee and a legal document would require and at the work session, from what I recall, and, and Bruce and Kirk, you were there, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't really recall there being much discussion or suggestion of of potential carrots or incentives. Yeah, there wasn't any. I think there was just, you could, the comment was probably more like, we don't want sticks. <laughs> um, but uh, I can, I will say, um, and uh, some of the developers brought this up because we had one meeting with developers to get their input on this uh this idea and uh some of them said you know what this is where the market is moving anyway and we also want to be seen as good partners with the city so there are incentives already for us to do that and so why do we need you know why do we need an ordinance for that i don't even know somehow that was that's their opinion um uh are we open for comments now overall andrew uh, I think I've got a couple more slides, but I can oh, take okay. any other questions that there are at this point. I guess my other question is, what's the enforceability of a policy versus an ordinance? Sure. So I believe that's on my next slide. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, in terms of administration, um, I would recommend the, the city engineer be the um, be the administer of this policy rather than 
um, the community development director. Um, the language in the ordinance technically says, or in the policy technically says, uh, city engineer or their designee. So most likely that would be kind of a combination of me and Chad administering this policy. And like I mentioned, I think at our last meeting, my vision for this is that this policy would be a requirement of the traffic impact studies, um, which I'll is in my next presentation, but essentially as part of that study, there'd be a section that says you will provide us a TDM plan that meets either tier one or tier two, depending on what your um, what your the size of your development. Um, and then that TDM plan going into compliance here, that TDM plan would have to be approved by staff, by engineering staff in this case, prior to the city issuing a, a building permit for the project. And then a step further, the city would have to verify that any structural TDM strategies, so things like uh, bike racks, transit facilities, um, showers, amenities, anything like that, wayfinding signage, staff would have to verify that those have actually been constructed and implemented um, before issuing a certificate of occupancy. And both of those compliance strategies are consistent with what the commission recommended. So those would kind of be the, the sticks that we have to enforce this. Um, unlike the, the ETC recommendation, there, there'd be no um, requirement for an annual status report. Um, the way I kind of see this is kind of noting that developers are already starting to implement some TDM strategies. I see this as kind of a step toward um, a potential ordinance in the future. So my vision would be if we were to adopt this and implement it, um, let's have it, let's implement it for maybe a year or two and then go back and do an analysis of what single, what if any single occupancy vehicle reduction we saw on those projects who applied it and either use that to guide updating the policy or use that to say, this is working well, maybe we should adopt some portions of this into an ordinance. Um, so that's, that's the kind of the next steps going forward that I see this headed in. Really, is the genesis of this about carbon emissions and, I mean, really about less people driving so there's less fossil fuels being, is that the, really the start of this? I can comment. The, the main impetus for this is to reduce congested travel times, but there are many other benefits um, desired as part of that including healthier lifestyles and better quality of life, less pollution, et cetera. But the initial thing that Bruce or Andrew, anybody uh, add if, if you don't agree with this, but was to reduce the congested times for traveling. Yes, that's what we talked yeah, about. Yeah, I would agree. I would say that, I would say, I mean, carbon emission reduction, I think is a very close second. Um, but in terms of Edina specifically, um, the kind of the, the motivation for it was to uh, reduce congestion in peak times. Not not to keep taking a scab here, but if we drop the speed limit, what does that do to traffic? I mean, how does that, what's the effect of reducing the speed and congestion? Is there a relationship one way or another? It's not obvious. Because reducing speed wouldn't increase or decrease cars that I can think of. But it's just me. Yeah, I don't know that that's a good it's a good question. I, I don't have an answer for you. Um I haven't read or seen anything to that either way to indicate whether it's what what impact lower speeds would have on congestion. You can only imagine that people would feel more comfortable on bikes and walking and maybe have an indirect effect, but that's that's pure speculation. Well, I think people are willing to do that when it's comfortable out, but we do, we, we, this isn't San Diego, you know, you know what I mean? I mean, I think when it's comfortable, I'm happy to ride a bike anywhere, but not when it's four degrees. Andrew, I was going to ask you about, um, I think it was maybe, uh, do you have, wait, I'm going to ask first. Do you have any more slides? No, this is it. Okay. Um, I think it was maybe your first slide where you said um, 
Bloomington has a TDM policy? They have an ordinance. They, they have an ordinance. Oh, you used to have, have Minneapolis and Bloomington. As I recall, and I, I think we heard this from Melissa, um, we're the only community on the 494 strip that does not have a TDM ordinance or policy, I believe. Uh, and that I think that's significant um, when you go to present this to the council. Maybe Bruce and Kirk, do you have more information on that? I think that's correct. And uh, that was one of the things we talked about. Uh, Eden Prairie has just a policy and at least some of the city um, staff wished they had had an ordinance. And I think, yeah, right. I, I believe, I believe Eden Prairie has a, they have a TOD ordinance. They have a transit oriented development ordinance. Um, but I, I I believe they their TDM uh, application or program is only is still at a policy level, but yeah. so I but I do think it's accurate that we're the only city in the 494 corridor commission that doesn't have either. Yeah, a policy or an ordinance. Yeah, I know that that was a a, a bit of a motivating factor um, for the council when we brought this up as a work plan item. Uh, so again, it might be a a helpful piece. To just amend that, just a just a dab. Sure, that's that's helpful. Andrew, uh, Bruce, and I were trading some notes earlier today, and we were thinking it would be information, it would be uh, educational, or and perhaps just really good for Edina Transportation Commission to have access to those submissions. And uh, do you what do you think about that, or what does anybody else think? The the TDM portion. Yeah, and I'd go even just a little farther than that um, in the process. Uh, I like it that there's a certificate of occupancy is pending you know, approval of the plan. Um, I'd like to see that the ETC is, does a review of the plan as an assist to the um, city engineer in making that decision. So you uh, correct me if I'm, I just want to make sure I understand when you're talking about submissions, you're talking about like the applications, the plans that are submitted. Yeah, so we can weigh in on it because we might have a different, you know, point of view uh, on it that might be helpful to the city. You know, there's 10, 12, whatever we have smart people looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, yeah, no, it might be helpful. I absolutely agree. And that's part of the reason why I envisioned the TDM plan being a component of the traffic study because we have a process now for the commission to review the traffic studies. So now there'll just be an added piece where that TDM plan is a either an appendix and with some of the findings um, referenced in the maybe in the body of the study. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree that I, I think there's value in having the commission review those as well. Oh yeah, I see. You're one step ahead of us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce and Kurt. It's tough to do. Sorry, Bruce and Kurt, just correct me if I'm wrong. When we worked on this, all those meetings we had, it looked like Andrew has put everything we have asked together here, right? Except the, the financial deposit, right? Um, yeah, I would say yes. And so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased about that. I kind of have gotten over the fact that we're not going to have a financial guarantee yet or an ordinance. My follow-up question was, also, what was the reason we decided to add that fifteen thousand or ten thousand dollar financial guarantee. Can you just remind me? Because I forgot. The reason was to provide some so-called teeth or some um, something quantitative to follow through and make it, um, you know, real or important. And there's one other thing that's not here that would have been in an ordinance, and that is the. Um, the measures looked at over time and a report out at, I think it was three years. Yeah. Um, and I think that's worth um, putting back in some way. Maybe it is, uh, maybe it is reserved for either a pilot, you know, program of looking back. Cause you mentioned that Andrew was saying, Hey, how do we know when we want to graduate from a policy or if we need to you know, a policy to an ordinance? There are, in the current policy, there isn't any measures over time, and I would recommend that we do at least on a pilot basis or for major developments. Sure, that's good feedback. I, um, to kind of go back to Bokar's question about the financial guarantee, I'd also, and, and 
Kirk or Bruce, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's some precedent too for cities uh, requiring a financial guarantee. I believe Bloomington requires one in the amount of fifty dollars per parking space, so it's it's half of what the ETC recommended. Okay, but now though you have added, uh, you know, for Bruce's recommendation, adding that last check, you know, working with the with the transportation commission to see what is being proposed, making sure that it meets the TDM. I think we can be okay with not having that financial tie up, right? So that's the last check that we get. I yeah, think so. Although, like I said, I, I think having some, at least some measures over time, I think would be helpful. I agree. I, I think maybe this is one uh, that we continue to put in the work plan, um, in our work plan, because I think that it, uh, checking the efficacy of this program, maybe over the first, uh, the you know, the first year or two as a policy, and then... Uh, and then possibly recommending that it move to ordinance status. I think that's the work of this commission. So I think we keep it in the. It's if it's not in the. It's not in the work plan for for uh, this coming year, is it, Andrew? Um, not specifically review of the TDM policy, but um, review of TDM plans is um, okay. Is in the work plan associated with traffic impact studies. Okay. Well, so let's, I uh, do think that there's opportunity to, I mean, I'm, it's, I mean, it's the end of the year. This, this work is going to continue into early next year. So um, right. I definitely think there will be more opportunities for the commission to, to certainly to weigh in. Yeah. Well, Bruce and Kirk, you're uh, both continuing on the commission, I believe. And so um, let's just remember this for, uh, for next year's work plan development for 22. Uh, that that we would revisit and and look at that data as you say, Bruce, uh, and and determine how effective it is over the long haul, mm -hmm. and and then whatever future recommendations this commission might have. That sounds like a lot of work. Thanks for you guys doing that. That that seems like a ton of work. You guys did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, and I I apologize. I should have mentioned this from the beginning, but. Um, kudos to the commissioners who were all the commissioners who were involved in putting together that draft recommendation. I think it's, I think it's really, really great. And it was very, uh, very helpful uh, for me in uh, preparing my recommendation. So I Thanks. think we've, there, I think we've got a, we've got a really good a starting of, point. Thanks. Thanks. And there was a lot of good partnership with planning commission and uh, city council members and Melissa, um, from the 494 corridor, so there was a lot of uh, cooperation. It was it was a good group. There were a lot of moving parts to it, though. You guys did a great job. That Thank development you. review meeting uh, that we had, I think it was late last year too. I I, I found that mm -hmm. very helpful. It was mm -hmm. very nice, very very beneficial to get that input from the developers. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. agree. Uh, yeah, exceeded, exceeded my expectations. That's for sure. I have one more question. Um, how many of these of potential TDM components would not be structural? So I see, you know, in order to get the certificate of occupancy, you're verifying that they've put in any of the structural components. So in some ways, I'm seeing that it almost makes that financial guarantee unnecessary unless there are a number of things that would be non structural. And if so, how do we verify that they've implemented those at a later date without that's, the reporting requirement? That's a good question. Some uh, some examples of some strategies that would be, in my opinion, non-structural would be um, things like subsidizing either transit passes or subsidizing use of shared mobility services um, and pretty much everything in the telecommuting uh, category. I mean, I, I suppose we could... In my opinion, it'd be difficult to verify with office buildings whether or not they have telecommuting resources and technology to all their employees. But um, so I guess I, I, that's kind of borderline structural or not structural versus not. It's too bad we don't have a recent example of telecommuting and whether it would actually function 
in society. I'd like to know that. Do we have any data on that? Are you being sarcastic? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm kidding. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was thinking that there are probably not many new commercial developments that won't at least consider what they would do in the case of telecommuting. They better do. Yeah, yeah better have hope, doing, I would hope not. Um, so I, I guess to follow up on that, that's a good point. Um, does the does the commission have any opinion on whether or not, you know, if I if I were to call out if we were to call out a minimum number of strategies, would it be worth specifying a certain number of them to be structural? Or if there's some way of asking for a for a report only for non structural items or some way of it's like there just seems to be a gap there of if what they choose are non structural items, then there's no feedback um, of knowing whether they've ever implemented them. Well, if you're going to do non structural, you could say somehow they need to create a fund for bus passes. I mean, they, you know, that you could, and again, that would, you know, you could do that for, for that aspect. Um, I think it, it, I think you would just, you would be, I think there are two mechanisms for collecting that information. One is to verify it on site. That's the structural. And the other one is to get to uh, survey response from the developer or the property owner. Structural ones, and I I think they're both I think they're both important. And um, if I don't have a strong feeling about whether there should be a certain percentage or certain number of structural ones, um, but it's based on what the ordinances are. If they're required to put in bike racks, if they're required to put in sidewalk, I mean, it depends on what they're required to do. Oh my. Oh, sorry, developers go ahead, Peter. Are pretty cutthroat. All I was going to say, developers are pretty cutthroat. They they are going to do whatever exactly they have to do, and so the more specificity, the better. And I think, Mindy, you're dead on. If you can't track it, it's going to be really hard. I mean, I think they're going to take if we had all these sort of theoretical things that couldn't be monitored, every developer would pick those because they don't want to have to deal with it. I, I mean, my sense. I mean, there's probably some that are really altruistic, but many of them are just. So bottom line focus that they're going to work it as much as they can. Mm -hmm. So I think the more tangible, quantifiable um, requirements, the better. And it also just occurred to me that in some cases, the developer and who will ultimately occupy the space are not necessarily the same. Sure. When you're dealing with larger developments, then yes, they're probably developing it for a particular. If it's a uh, commercial, they're developing it for someone in particular, but I think of like the the mixed use building for 44th and France that of course they've created uh, retail on the first level and residential above. Um, and they thought they would have a restaurant in there, but of course they don't currently have a tenant for that restaurant space. So how do they know what that ultimately the business that goes into that space the developer has no idea what TDM strategies they might or might not in, uh, uh, to implement because they don't yet know who that occupant will be. So how does that fit in then to these requirements? And I guess to kind of expand on, on Peter's point, um, from my own experience seeing what developers have done, I think there's generally I've seen a preference toward more structural strategies rather than non-structural and I, I, my mission is that part of the part of that is is a cost component because um the structural components some of them may be more expensive in the short term but you think of the cost of putting in a couple more bike racks compared to subsidizing transit passes for all of your tenants for you know who know an indefinite indefinite period of time um, that adds up, and I, I'm sure that's a, a factor that developers are considering. Andrew, it's my opinion that you just leave it the way it is, and let's see how it plays out for a year. I, I think so, too. There's one thing uh, I, that may be helpful in a way. Um, it says the city engineer has to approve it, and I don't know if you want to put in some wording, you know, something about based on the 
uh, scale or scope of the project and current city goals. Uh, because I wouldn't want them to think, hey, you just hit your five and you're done. Or have them think that uh, they have no idea of how reasonable the city staff will be in measuring yeah. their strategies. Well, that's that's a that's a good point, um, and I definitely think there's going to be some discretion. That, there's going to be some discretion that staff has on how effective certain strategies will be compared to others, depending on not only the size of the development but the location of it and the what type of land use it is. Um, if a if a development comes in and they say we'll build a we'll build a nice new transit and right on the corner and they're nowhere near a transit route, we're not going to count that as an effective TDM strategy because that doesn't accomplish anything. Yeah, and if they say yeah, I'm not going to do any you know bike lockers or anything, but I'll put a nice sign pointing to the bus stop. You know, the city engineer will say yeah, that's not responsive. That's not enough. Well, that's so I mentioned earlier, but there's some there's some agencies. Well, actually, only one that I can think of. Um, Saint San Francisco has a point system where they assign point values. You're probably familiar with it. They assign point values to different strategies, and then the city tells the developer, "Okay, you're based on your size and your land use. You have to achieve this many points worth of TDM strategies." And then from there, the developer, the applicant, has a menu of options to select from. So in that case, if they needed to get 20 points and a bike rack is only one point, they can't just do a bike rack and be, you know, be in compliance. In some ways, that makes it a more clear measure and it makes it fair for all developers um, that they can see ahead of time that they have to meet a certain point threshold and these are the points. Although, like you said, that could be a little hard to establish what's the point value of, you know, <laughs> a transit shelter that's not on a transit route. Yeah, the, the committee talked about this, uh, you know, a fair amount. And that idea, especially that type of point ranking system, everyone seemed like that was a great idea. Uh, that was the first breath. And then the second breath, it was like, you know, like how are we going to implement something like that? You know, so I think it, we left it at um, sort of along the lines to paraphrase an old uh, saying, I may not be able to define a good TDM plan, but I know one when I see one. <laughs> and that's the reason if we have it as a policy first, we have time to figure out where it works and doesn't work. Before yeah, that's true. Codify yeah. it as an ordinance. Exactly. Exactly. So if we pick this back up in, in 22, and look at you know what what actually has occurred again it goes to the the long term is is it effective are we actually reducing sov trips uh and how are developers using the ordinance to actually build that or not and then and then we can talk about changes to the policy we want and whether we want it to be an ordinance and uh, i i think we've got a really great starting point and it's my opinion that we just go forward with this. Andrew, I think you did a good job of encapsulating uh, the group's work, and um, hopefully the council will take it. Well, I Again, I appreciate the work that this commission and the, the TDM committee did last year, and I appreciate the, the feedback and perspective that this group provides. Great. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is, oh, the traffic, yours again, the traffic impact study policy framework policy. Yeah, it kind of one in the same. Oh. Um, sorry, just going to get a drink here quick. And it spilled all over myself. Kirk, by the way, it's nice to have you back. So sorry again for the disruptions. No problem. No problem. Um, I guess before I get into this, just a question, Kirk, since you're, we can hear your audio now. When we get to your member comments, would you be able to um, yeah. 
give me your questions for the speed limit again? Yes. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to talk about the traffic impact studies in general. So um, this is, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the kind of the, again, recap the purpose of our traffic impact studies, um, go into when they're required study areas and then the required components. Um, one thing I want to mention kind of before we start is for the most part, this is really nothing new. This is really just, uh, this policy is just, or this draft policy, I should say, is just outlining or explaining the process that the city already has in place, um, but writing it down so that it's clear to everybody um, what the what the expectations are, and so that we have a we have a guiding document that we can refer to and that we can amend in the future if necessary. Um, so again, uh, the purpose of our traffic impact studies or TIS are to assess the transportation impacts of proposed developments and redevelopments. And they also they also are helpful to evaluate whether proposals are appropriate for a given site or whether or not there are any infrastructure improvements that may need to be made as part of proposed projects. So these are the require these are the criteria that um, dictate when a project requires is is required to complete a, a traffic impact study. Um, so generally projects that increase the existing site density, whether that's increasing residential units or increasing the building square footage. Um, projects that request a parking stall variance. Um, park prop, uh, projects that request a rezoning or a comp plan amendment. These are generally properties that are changing an existing use of the site. Um, and then. This is kind of a, a new one that I would like to add. Um, are projects that are adjacent to intersections that operate at a level of service D or lower. So these are intersections that are operating at a, at a higher level of congestion right now and may be more sensitive to um, increase increases in adjacent traffic um, or projects that are along roadways or corridors that are operating at a volume to capacity ratio ratio of 0.8 or higher. So again, these would be roadways that are identified as um, already being uh, moderate to highly congested and could be more sense are more sensitive to uh, increases in adjacent traffic. Uh, the study. So get to this. Um, are there cases where our TDM policy, as we've just described it, um, would apply to a development that does not have a traffic impact study requirement? I'm thinking like if they're redeveloping on a site and it isn't increasing the site density but yet still might fall under the tier one or tier two for TDM? That's a good question. I, I would have to check. I, I wouldn't think for the most part, I don't think that there would be projects that would kind of fall into that crack, but I can't definitively say that there are no instances, um, but that's, that's a good point. I'll look into that and review that. Um, talking about the study area for these traffic studies. So generally they, the areas to be studied include all immediate roadway roadways, uh, and intersections, including site accesses that are proposed or existing. Um, re additional roadways and intersections are currently included at staff's direction based on the size and the location of the developments. And I'll, I'll share a couple examples later on. Um, actually, it's my next slide. And then the um, city also, we ask that developers or we require that developers um, include traffic studies from other approved projects within the last five years. Um, if their study areas kind of overlap or if they, if they border each other. So to kind of give some recent examples. So these are the 2 most recent development projects that the commission reviewed. You may recognize these maps from my memo. Um, but so on the left, we have the 7001 France project. Um, its limits, and then the dots here show the limits of the study area, the intersections and roadways that are included. Um, so some projects that fall within that study area that whose traffic studies we would also want to have looked at um, would include, in this case, the promenade residences that are at the 
the previous site for the Guitar Center, and then um, there's another adjacent one. There's the um, 6950 France Avenue, or no, that's on this one. Um, but then on the right, we have the 6600, 6800 France proposal, uh, its limits and the roadway roadways and intersections that were included in that study area. Um, adjacent projects would include the um, the U.S. Bank building, restoration hardware, Shake Shack, um, but notably under the as the study areas as I've defined them, these two um, don't intersect or overlap, so their studies would not necessarily be required to be a part of each other. Um, that would be an instance where staff might ex exercise some discretion and say, um, particularly in the Southdale area, we might be more sensitive to impacts on France Avenue. We, so we may require them to look at developments that are further out from that study area. But just kind of give some examples of how study areas have compared to projects in the past. So now kind of to briefly discuss the required components, I won't, I'll try not to list all of these out so you can see them in the document. Um, but these reports generally start with kind of an executive summary that, that summarizes the findings of the consultant and what they, what they're recommending for as far as, uh, potential mitigation strategies. There's a description of the project. So it talks about the size and the land use and those kind of things, the site map and existing traffic conditions. Um, with uh, annual daily traffic levels and level of service of the adjacent intersections. The studies include trip generation data, so site estimated um, volume and peak hour traffic. Um, most consultants uh, look at two different metrics. They look at the uh, Institute for Transportation Engineers, they're kind of a national data set, and some, if they have it, use their own local data sets to, to inform the recommendations uh, or inform their analysis. Um, distribution of traffic on adjacent roadways and then pass by assumptions. So how many trips, um, how many, how many, not necessarily new trips, but how many uh, current trips are traveling on adjacent roadways that may now divert to um, a, a project site. Uh, capacity analysis is looking at the looking at specifically at the roadways and intersections that are adjacent, um, looking at the the level of service for those intersections. So if you recall, intersection level of service is generally quantified with a uh, letter scale A B C D E, or actually it's A B C D and then F. I don't think that there's an E. Um, a being a, a A being a intersection that has uh, very few delays. Um, and D and F having being an intersection that has a high level of delay. Uh, looking at volume to capacity ratios for adjacent corridors, adjacent roadways. So that's estimating based on the based on the lane configurations of the road, you can make assumptions on how much how much traffic that roadway can uh, accommodate, and then comparing that to how much volume they estimate will give you a sense for uh, how congested that roadway. Uh, will be at certain times. Looking at vehicle queue lengths at intersections and then um, identifying congestion safety problems under full development with recommended mitigation strategies. Uh, the parking analysis uh, calculates the parking stalls that are required based on city code and then again using both the national and local data um, looking at estimating how much parking stall demand a project uh, may may require, and generally this those two uh, those values um, are important chiefly when a project is looking to obtain a parking stall variance. Multimodal facilities we we want the traffic studies to identify existing and proposed uh, ped bike transit and shared mobility facilities that are adjacent to the site. Um, or within the site. Uh, like I mentioned before, this TDM plan would now be a component of the traffic impact studies. So the requirements of either a tier one or a tier two, depending on the size of the development. And then 
the appendix at the end, which essentially has all of the calculations, data, figures, and any other pertinent information that is required to help justify the, the conclusions in the report. So that's traffic our traffic impact studies in a nutshell. Hey Andrew, are we is there been a trend one way or the other to limit the number of spots that a building has to have or does or or re reduce the amount that they have to have? You mentioned variance several times. What does that typically entail? Um I don't have the I don't have specific numbers to to justify a trend. Um I would say based on my based on my recollection, um it seems to be that a significant number of developments request parking stall variances. Um part of that in my opinion is because our parking ordinance I think is is very out of date compared to industry standards. Um so we are Ordinance dates back from a time when the automobile was really the only way, the primary way for people to get around. And those pr the primary way that our, our streets and parking lots were designed for. Um, so I, I think that there's some improvement that can be made in our parking ordinance. Um, but I don't know, I don't have enough data to, to speak to a trend in requests for parking style variances. No, no, what I'm, what I'm asking is, are we, is the city, when the new de a development happens, are we requiring, are, the reason I ask is in downtown Minneapolis, for the longest time, they were demanding that developers added a lot of parking spaces in the project. Then they went the other direction where they started limiting and literally said, you can't have, you can only have so many parking spots because we're trying to drive these other things. And my question is, is where, when these variances, are they to ask for more spaces or less spaces? Oh, sorry, no, uh, it almost, uh, the, the variance is only required if they're proposing less spa fewer spaces than what the city requires. There oh. have been, there have been some projects that, I think very few projects um, that have provided more parking spaces than what the city requires. Um, but generally speaking, the, um, the, Majority of developments, I would say, typically ask for to put in less parking than what the city requires. Lori, you're muted. Thanks. <laughs> I did a good job talking to myself. Um, couple things and uh, and they go back to when we had our our education session was back um, one of the things I would like to see as a required component um, it is a, is a me is a methodology I'd like to see how they collected their data um, so we know that there are best practices for data collection particularly um, as it relates to counting traffic um, I know the times of day I want to know if they had video cameras out there over the long haul. I want to know if they had somebody sitting out there. Um, so I, I think that the that the methodology is probably an important aspect. And then I, I don't know if there's a place to put this, but I know we talked about the fact that the city hires the TIS contractor um, and and the developer pays the city to pay the contractor. But it sounded like um, very often the developer um, tells you who they want to have hired, or even they hire them themselves, but the city pays them and it's a pass-through. Um, there's something about that process that needs cleaning up, and I don't know if it needs to show up here, um, but there might be something around process that should show up here. Sure. Um, I guess going back to your, your methodology comment, I just, I guess, just to clarify, would you want, would your preference to be just that we ask them to provide their methodology or that we have, we have like a methodology require, like a, we set a standard for their methodology that they have to follow. 
that's ultimately what I was hoping for, that when you did a framework, you would kind of outline uh, at least some of the best practices um, that specifically relate to data collection. Um, but but in without that, at least knowing how they did what they did will help the city know which contractors should they continue to hire, for example, which ones should they do some education with and which ones, because if there are some contractors that do it uh, a, a little less complete than others, then that's who the contractor or that's who the developers are going to want to hire. Seems like. Sure, I I understand that logic. I from my experience, the the it seems to me that the if developers have a preference for a consultant, it generally it tends to be more ones that they've worked with before, ones that they already have relationships with. Yeah. Um, I guess I can't speak to whether or not that's you know, the, their methodology and associated costs have anything to do with that. But um, the city also sometimes goes to consultants that they know have a history in that area um, mm -hmm. because they already, we know that they have uh, the data and the knowledge of the area and the, the expertise to give a more informed decision than somebody who's right. coming brand new into an area that they've never studied before. Right. Well, I, I would sooner have the city choose the contractor uh, because that is the way the process, is, it sounds like the, that is the way the process is supposed to go. Um, but at the very least, if a if a developer wants to give you a list of preferred contractors, I mean, then they should give you their top three. And maybe one of those fits what the city and that So those were some of the things I kind of thought might be in this framework, the best practices for data collection. Um, and, and you got a lot of them because you got adjacent intersections and you know you got a lot of those of what you want to see done i just think there are some nuances to data collection that that are important um and then also that um the who is who is contracted to do the tas and what is the what if any is relationship or what if any uh say does the developer have in that process sure I don't know some of the rest of you that were at that education session. Does any of that, especially you, Bokar, any of that sort of fit for you? Yes, actually, you beat me to the punch. Yes, I agree with what you said, hundred percent. But I also had another. When we talk about adjacency, we're looking at right, basically left. You know, assuming they all have the same vertex, right? But I have a few questions first. The first one is when you talk about adjacent, for instance, for the seven years, 7001 project, the yep. street would be uh, France Avenue. And what else? So in that case, the adjacent streets are France Avenue and 70th Street. Okay, France Avenue and 70th Street. So that's, that's it. So now let's say, let's go down to, to, to the um, guitar center, what would be the adjacent for those two, for that building? For the promenade residences at the guitar center site, the only adjacent roadway is Hazleton. Okay, so there is a little bit of uh, unfairness for each developer is that I think. But what I'm trying to get at is to mitigate this. Is there a possibility we take it into a tier? basically look at it as a tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one would be basically the minimum that the city is doing right now that meets the standards, whatever that is, right? We take it as tier one. Then tier two would be you do the minimum, but also you're looking at not just the adjacent streets, but you go beyond. Let's say you go to York Avenue for the seven years, 7001 project. Okay. Then tier three would be you doing the basics, plus you're looking at the adjacent, but you're also looking at the project, let's say at 6,600, 6,800, right? Then based on that, the city council decides the scoring they would give you based on if you've done minimum, because at the end of the day, we do the development over time, the city is going to absorb the cost of redoing the streets or figuring out the best way to move people, right? 
So I think if you have different tiers, we'll know the city. We look at it and say, okay, it's tier one. They did the basic. So this is what it's going to take. Tier two, you got extra point or bonus. Tier three, that's the best we can get. Basically, it gives us a compounded view of really the reality of how our traffic is going to be looking like in that corridor. That's... Um... I appreciate the suggestion. Um, I would say I, my concern would be, um, one, there could be some inequity between uh, development proposals. There, by, that by that standard, there could be some projects that maybe have the ability to afford a bigger study area um, compared to other projects. Um, but more generally speaking, I would say that the, the consultants that we hire um, generally do the scope of work that we that we tell them that they're required to do. And they come up with a price for that. And then the develop, like Lori said, the developer um, cuts a check to the city and then the city pays a consultant for that work. So if, exactly. if we were to do, if we were to do a tiered system, like what you're describing, um, I would think that that might be more appropriate in relation specifically to the study area. So Perfect. similar to how the, like the TDM policy has, different requirements based on the size of your development. There could be something similar where based on the size of the development that the study area has to be so far out. Um, and I think that would, I think that would accomplish some of the, what you're getting at, but for some, I mean, for some smaller developments, I mean, big enough that they require a study, but small enough that they really don't have any, direct any impact other than directly in front of them there's not really a, there's not really much point to looking at a street that's five, five blocks away if it's a really small development for the big yeah. developments possibly um, right. you're right andrew then we'll call that a tier one right because when you look at the adjacency adjacent adjacencies right like the adjacent properties or streets in one instance, you mentioned only one street that is adjacent, right? So that also is a little, it's the, the, the balance is not there. But if you do with a cheer, you're right. You look at uh, the small, let's say a mall that doesn't require a lot, that's a tier one. We know that's what you need. But you also have tier two, that's gonna be more complicated. Tier three, much more complicated because over time it's gonna impact how the city moves people. And then the city doesn't end up having the short end of the stick by spending all the tax, taxpayers' money <laughs> developing these projects. That's where I'm going. I guess I would also say that the the city doesn't necessarily only stick to adjacent roadways. There's there's instances where at staff's discretion we want them to look at a bigger study area. So 7001 France, I'd say, is an example of that. The immediately adjacent roadways are only France and 70th, but we told them to include in their scope of work, look at this segment of York and this segment of Hazleton too. Basically look at the entire surrounding block. That was um, a in, work. in the case of 66, 68 France, we, as you can see, we didn't do that. We only looked, had them look at the, the uh, surrounding streets and intersections. And that one is the one you needed to do a lot more, right? Because you have 62 is close to 62 is close to Valley View is close to yeah, just yes, you're right. What you did there is absolutely correct. I agree with that. You ask more, but put them in tiers. So it's very clear and defined. So there is no misunderstanding. Or uh, depending on who you're talking to. Yeah, I get what you're saying, Bokara. It, I, I, I kind of hear you both saying something similar. Um, uh, and I think, Andrew, you're asking for more discretion on the part of the city staff to engage uh, further out. And I think, Bokar, you're saying, but but actually, if you could define some of it so that it would be clear, um, I, I think we can have it both ways. But I think uh, I, I think doing what Bokar is asking and having uh, some mechanism for identifying uh, sort of the potential of the site uh, either based on the size of the site or the or the likely development that's coming in um, to say this would be a you know likely this is either 
a tier one or tier two based on what's coming in or, you know, based on the development. But I think you can say that. I, I mean, I think you can uh, draw some uh, a bit of parameters without without uh, closing yourself off for also uh, adding more or saying, well, actually, you probably don't need to do that. No, that's a good point. I, I agree. Um, I'd also say that the the context of the development also plays a factor where it's located in, in this uh, you know, in this case, these both of these projects are um, in very commercial, high density areas. Um, for you know, sixty sixty six hundred France, for example, there there may be some benefit in looking at intersections, maybe you know, further up and down France or up and down Valley View. Um, I doubt that there would be much benefit in looking further to the west and evaluating those streets in that on that residential side. Maybe at the first intersection, just to relieve some concerns of adjacent property owners. But you know, if we were to go five blocks into this neighborhood, I doubt that the traffic patterns would be significantly impacted by a development like this. Especially if the speed limit's twenty-five or twenty. <laughs> <laughs> well, these consultants, these studies only look at volume. They don't necessarily. They don't look at speed. Well, I, I'm looking at volume. So I, I think of that area, of areas, um, I think of 70th Street as an opportunity for, you know, like, would you actually go to the intersection of uh, 70th and whatever's that cut through that goes to Valley View Road? Because that is one of the ways that the cars will get, get out of the 7,000 France area and get to Crosstown. They won't just go down France. They'll also go down 70th at least as far as the turnabout the turnaround thing roundabout i think is what it is uh and then turn right and go over to valley view and cross over i mean so or they'll take 70th all the way down to 100th and so there may be reason to look into the into the neighborhood streets if it's a major conduit to the highways because those are a lot of business customers sure that's a good point Anybody else have uh, uh, feedback for Andrew on on the TDM? No, not TDM. Traffic impact study uh, framework. Sorry, policy. Yeah. Either or. Well, I really like the idea of. I mean, this the slide on the screen right now. I think this is a great addition to consider. You know, nearby uh, developments at the same time, a new uh, traffic impact study is done. Nice ad. I will say it is something that it's it's one of the things that, in my experience, that residents are likely to complain about, or that that's a misconception, or that they feel that these studies don't take into account traffic generated from other developments or other projects under construction. Well, that's actually, you're right, it's a little hard to tell from the studies because most of them reference the SPAC study from several years ago as their baseline that they're measuring changes off of. So they don't, uh, the last one we just saw for 7001, it didn't explicitly say, I don't recall that here's the impact of, of these two projects together. Did it? I don't believe it phrased it that way. I think there was language in there that said that um, that basically identified these are other these are adjacent developments that are within the scope of influence for this study, and that their their data was you know considered or reviewed as part of the analysis. But you're you're right. Ideally, that language to that effect. Is included in the study so that it's clear. Yeah. And and that and so like one more one more reason to do what Bokar is saying, which is to make it clear that uh, if it is to be the kind of generation based on the size of the of the development, uh, and it's in an area that already has development, that whether you put it into a tiered system, I, it, it makes sense to me to put it in a tiered system that maybe isn't so rigid that you can't flex it one way or the other, but so that there's a general understanding 
that this kind of development gets the adjacent inter in, you know intersections, this kind of development gets the adjacent intersections and uh, these other things, and this is the largest has the biggest impact, so it gets it gets a broader area impact study. Sure, or something. Yeah, no, that's that's a good suggestion. Anything else on this? Thank you, Andrew. You delivered big time this month. <laughs> it was overdue. <laughs> Long overdue. Okay, we're on our work plan updates, uh, of which we may have a, we may have um, completion actually. Come on, it's thinking. Is that is that tiny on your screen? Oh, that's much better. <laughs> Um, um, Clover Ride, anything new on that, Mindy? That I'm aware of. Okay. I think I, uh, Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I haven't gotten an update from Darts yet on either ridership statistics or, um, or whether or not the plastic barriers have been installed yet. Yeah, I think, I think we're, um, sort of on a, in a pandemic holding pattern. On a few things. Next. Um, review and comment on traffic impact studies. I think we um, just did that, which shows up for November. And nothing since then. Oh, I, I, uh, I will mention though that the for those of you that didn't watch the council meeting on Tuesday, the seven thousand one France project um, was approved for preliminary rezoning and overall development plan. Okay. The sixty six hundred France project, I believe, has been delayed to for council until January or so. Okay. Did and staff recommended uh, denying that one? Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Great. TDM. Woot. Bruce and Kirk. Nice work. You're complete. Go team. <laughs> uh, traffic impact study. Bokar, Jill, and Andrew. That's complete too, yes? That's what we just did tonight. Yep. With just with a few tweaks based on your feedback on feedback. Yeah, I think for I think for that framework and for probably probably for the framework and TDM, um, I'd like to make a few tweaks and, and bring back to the commission for another look. Great. Thank you. Uh, the educational activities that was complete the last time, I believe. Correct. Go back through that. And there's no traffic safety report today, so I think we're um, we're done with traffic safety reports for 2020. Correct. The traffic safety committee canceled our would have been our November meeting um, due to staff availability, but we actually just met today, so there will be a report in January. Okay. And the CIP is done. No update. Other than that, the uh, equity criteria will be coming back again for another review next year. Great. Great. And that is it. It's a good year. Cheers. You're here. And uh, we don't have Matt here to talk about the street funding task force update. Andrew, do you have anything on that? Uh, I don't, other than um, I believe the, the task force is going to try to kind of finalize their, or, or wrap up their recommendations early next year. Um, 
but other than the the report and the information that Matt presented last time, I don't have any update. Okay. Great. Then I think we're into um, chairman member comments, maybe. Yep. So, um, why don't you just call on us in order, so <laughs> so it's not so messy. Certainly, uh, Mindy. Uh, yes, I had just one comment in looking for uh, the link for this meeting. I again saw the email about the tree ordinance. Um, and while what they looked at of the existing tree ordinance is important, um, it wasn't exactly what at least I was asking to be addressed. I don't know if other commissioners have the same um, impression. Because this only deals with the replacement of existing trees. And I was looking for ways that we can like increase trees, um, such as it came up when we do street reconstruction or when we put in a sidewalk that then creates a boulevard that might create an opportunity for adding trees. Or for places where it might like along a what might be park land that adding trees might act as a traffic calming. Um, mechanism, so none of that gets none of that gets covered in the existing tree ordinance. A hundred percent agree. That was my take on it also, uh, and it it missed the entire living streets aspect of uh, for, of the tree policy, which I'm not surprised about, but disappointed in. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think the the scope was much more limited than the reasons why we as a group brought it up, I think a year and a half ago. Yeah. And also what uh, Lori and I learned talking with St. Louis Park. So what so, can we do going forward? Mindy, maybe this is part of your comments, but. I, I, I suppose like that would be. A gap. Gap. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know what happens with that. If it's a, once we've commented on it, then is there a way we can you know, I guess it was council that put it on Park and Rec's work plan. Do we create some sort of memo to council? I, I think addressing that this is a gap. I'm I sorry. think we've got that put it on Park and Rec's um, work plan. Um, and what I'd like to what I'd like to propose, and we can discuss it maybe in January, is that mm -hmm. we go to council. Um, I think in June is our is our work plan or is our work session with them that we request an additional initiative to be to be specific to uh, living streets and trees uh, trees and and I guess I'd say other foliage for traffic calming. I guess to to add to that, um, I was going to mention my staff comments, but. In my work plan next year is a review of the a review slash update of the living streets plan. So there will be an opportunity as part of that, maybe a couple opportunities to for the commission to provide feedback. And that could be an example of where the commission could talk about boulevard trees. Well, I'd love just to consider adding an initiative on this. Yep, the commission could certainly do that too. Or write an advisory to the to the council too. That's also another tool. Okay. Thanks, Mindy. Anything else, Mindy? Thank you. No, except did you say is the is the work session with council scheduled already? Because I don't see it on the schedule of meetings. And it's always good for me to get them on my calendar ahead, uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, I think they haven't finalized the work session schedule yet. Um, okay. We did, as part of submitting the work plan, the commission put their preference for June, um, but I, I don't know definitively whether or not that's what will be given. So as soon as I have that, I'll add it to the schedule and let the commission know. Okay. Thank you. No further comments. Thanks, Mindy. Kirk? Hi. Oh, for, um, yes, back to the traffic um, speed limit conversation. And forgive me if I'm repeating anything, just stop me. But uh, there were three things I thought of that would make the information for the proposal better or complete. And those three things, the first is is the in the category of data, 
if we're talking about going from 30 to a better speed limit, like what would be the perceived difference based on any kind of data steps to go to 20 or 25, if those are two targets that have been contemplated, I realize 25 is the uniform base recommended, but I, I wasn't aware of what was really the improvement or you know why that was better than 20, especially when it looks like at least two of our neighboring cities have 20 and St. Louis Park may be going toward that and Minneapolis, at least in the bordering areas have 20. Um, in which it goes to my second point of three with the uniformity aspect. If, if uniformity and uh, consistency was really a driving force, then it just didn't seem to make sense when going to a different speed limit than what our bordering cities are, because it just brought in another um, variance, it seemed like, for as noted on that slide, I think it was 11 for St. Louis Park. And then the, the third one was the behavior aspect. It was like, what would we expect from enforcement and then just behavior? I know some there's some data, I don't know it my, myself, but there's some data about what is acceptable for driving above a speed limit. So if the speed limit is 20, what does that mean for Edina? Or what does it mean for 25? What people would actually be driving and then what would uh, enforcement be like? So those are three areas I thought could be addressed better. Um, and then I had a personal one uh, about just speed limits. I've lived in Edina for a while. I've lived in Southwest Edina for um, 12 years. I lived in Northeast Edina for about 12 years and then Northwest Edina about 10 years. And all of those streets have been either short city blocks or curvy. And uh, for me to drive on any of those areas at 30 miles per hour, um, which I know is like maximum speed or speed limit it'd be insane uh you know driveways kids dogs uh, all that 25 i actually tried it again today in my my area in um, northeast quadrant of edina i just couldn't do it for even half a block it was so fast there were parked cars uh, i was afraid <laughs> that i would uh cause some damage or hurt somebody and so i was trying 20 and i thought that was like for me and my driving, that was about as much as I could do. So I say all that because I've lived in several areas. I think maybe I'm conservative, but I think that um, my impressions, but tied in with some more safety data would be really helpful to make a case. I'm not comfortable um, feeling confident that a direction to make a lot of sign change would be like an answer to like peter said maybe some of the problems aren't quite defined although i think andrew you said there's a there was a survey that a lot of residents wanted slower but if we're going to invest in making it slower i want to make sure we're going to the right target speed and have data to back it up sorry that was kind of long but uh, thank you thank you it was perfect Any other update aside from those comments? No, thank you. Okay. And Mindy, thanks for bringing up the trees. I was going to otherwise. Bokar? Well, I uh, really don't have a, much of a comment. I just thank you very much, Andrew, for putting all of this stuff together and being patient as we go through these hard discussions, but they're constructive, okay? So thank you, and beside that, uh, we covered, I think, everything we needed to talk about tonight. Thank you for being patient with me. Anytime. <laughs> Peter? I wish I would have had a chance to add something to the uh, commission tonight. I didn't really get a chance to talk. That was another joke. I'm sorry. I'm a little dry. Here. Sorry. Um, You're getting on. We're catching on to you. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's hard for me to be serious after to all three hours. No, uh, no, I thought it was great. Um, you know, enjoy the spirited discussions. And I love 
hearing everyone's different perspectives and I'm learning a lot, which I really appreciate. And, um, you know, Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Happy New Year, whatever you're celebrating. I, I hope everybody has a much improved 21. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. That was great. Bruce? Uh, nothing for me, really, except Peter's shape. You appear, appear to be shape shifting on the video there. Is that anyone else notice that? If it's, it's just me with a flashback, then I'll just be quiet. But I appreciated that. It's ble bleeding into his background a little bit. Uh, Nihar? Oh, I think we lost Are Nihar. You working? Is that, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, okay, that's great. I guess I fixed it. Oh. I don't have any comments uh, for this meeting, but I did think that this meeting was a lot more lively than the other ones that I've been uh, watching, which I really enjoyed. Thanks, Nihar. Hey, Anna? Yeah, I don't really have any comments either. Just like as Nihar said, this meeting was, there were a lot of people talking, a lot of discussion. So it was really just like more, I don't know, uh, just like entertaining to watch and <laughs> converse. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Anand? Uh, I also have no comments and I thought this meeting was very engaging and I learned a lot. So thank you guys. Great. And Lori. Um, I have a couple things. Um, wanted to, and maybe some of this is in your staff comments, Andrew, so you can stop me. I, I was going to let folks know uh, if you don't already know or you're not watching, um, I don't know if it's on Better Together, but for sure it's on Nextdoor. Um, the, the, the signals at 58th and France, um, I think they have now been taken down. Uh, and the plan is not to reinstall them into the, in, until spring. Um, uh, I have grave concerns about this intersection. So the plan at this point is not to have any control on that intersection other than uh, stops on 58th, both directions um, approaching France. Um, I think this is a, a, a safety issue for pedestrians and bikers, including a lot of kids who are going to be going to and from Pamela. Um, to skate. And so I, I did have a couple of emails. Uh, I had a couple of email conversations and then a conversation with Chad Milner uh, about the intersection. And I, I'm going to leave the rest to you, Andrew, because you probably do have something on this topic. Uh, I don't. I guess I was I was kind of waiting to see how much you talked about uh, okay. how much you mentioned, but okay. um, uh, well, I'm I'm hopeful after talking with Chad that um, that they will put something, some mitigation um, signage in on France. Um, he talked about a couple of possibilities, and I know he's trying to work with the county, um, and it's it's really the county's road. They do not want to have a four-way stop, um, but I I do have real concerns about this, and um, you know the. The engineer that sent out the message said that the people in the area should try to use different and safer access points. And my my biggest issue with this is that there are no better and safer access points between 54th and Crosstown. There are no controlled intersections between 54th and Crosstown. So anybody that lives on either side of France in this area, unless they're pretty close to 54th, um, there's there's not a place for them to get across France, particularly if they're on, on foot or on bike. So um, we'll see how that evolves. Um, and it's it's a bit of a debacle. I feel bad for the city staff that having to having to field this one because it's a tough situation. What happened? Why are they removing the signs? So the um, the poles were the the location of the poles was were designed a certain way and when they were actually installed for I think three of the four poles their locations were moved during prior to them being in or in the process of them being installed um, I'm not it's, I'm not really clear on why specifically they were installed sometimes things are moved in the field to 
avoid utility conflicts that are unexpected, but for whatever reason they were moved and now their new locations um, are problematic in that they're located um, too close to the curb and that we're we're expecting that if they are to remain up in the winter that they're almost certainly going to be hit by a snowplow and be taken down, which obviously would be a significant uh, concern uh, for the traveling public. So um, like Lori said, the the we're kind of the construction seasons essentially over. We don't really have the ability to to move them uh, right now in the in the remaining portion of the year. Um, the county has not let us put in a, an all way stop. Um, so the the only option we have is to do a two way stop and to remove the poles so that they're not a, an obstruction or is a safety hazard in the winter and then relocate them uh, in the spring. So yeah, it's it's a problem, and and I'll say uh, the you know the previous poles were hit by school buses, and I mean that it's a it's a problematic intersection. It makes it more difficult that the county um, gets to say what's on France. Um, my hope is that um, as as I told Chad, for those of you that were, that were on the commission when we met with the Richfield Commission. Uh, Transportation Commission and Richfield said you need to um, you you need to push harder on the county. You can get what you want from the county, but you, you can't just take no for an answer. Um, Chad's really well aware of this. I, I feel confident in in our staff's ability to uh, to get something <laughs> out of this process so that it it becomes a safer intersection for the next five months because it's a long period of time. So there's that. Um, I did want to um, thank you all for your great work this year. It's been a really bizarre year, um, but the Transportation Commission has gotten really all of its work done, um, whether we've done it from our porches or, or together in meetings. Um, you guys are a crackerjack group of folks, and I, I look forward to a better 2021. Um, and in the meantime, as Peter said, happy holidays to all of you. Please be safe. Um, and and really celebrate the incoming new year. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Lori. Um, for my comments, um, the again for those who didn't watch the council meeting on Tuesday, um, council did approve the Creek Knoll reconstruction project with the Beard Avenue sidewalk. Um, some of you may recall that we did get a petition against that sidewalk, but council did approve to put it in. Um, the Melody Grandview Birchcrest project, um, that the decision on that project has been delayed for no more than six months um, so that staff can proceed with design and, and look at uh, going out for bids to see uh, how the prices may, how our bid prices may impact the assessments. Um, because there's some concerns about the assessment amount not meeting the benefit question. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the 56th Street sidewalk, and for now the sidewalk is uh, remaining as a part of the project. Um, I mentioned the approval of the 7001 France project. Um, Metro Can uh, Met Met Transit sorry, is uh, scoping out traffic analysis on France Avenue specific to the E-Line. Um, so they're not doing they're not doing a traffic now. My understanding is they're not doing a traffic analysis along the whole corridor. They're only selecting two segments of it. One segment is in Minneapolis, and the other segment uh, is on France in Edina. So looking forward to seeing the those those results. Um, and then last thing I wanted to share was just kind of echoing Lori's comments about what the commission has accomplished this year. I just wanted to kind of recap what nice. the commission what the commission did this year um uh tested out the north loop of the clover ride unsuccessfully unfortunately but it's still we gave it a shot um reviewed traffic studies for these four development projects um proposed a travel demand management ordinance to city council uh created social media posts for transportation tuesday reviewed 140 traffic safety requests um including and the, the these two recommendations the always stop at beard and 57th and the no outlet sign for interlock and bluff those were both approved by council following etc recommendation um 
commented on the equity criteria for the PACs, commented on the rotary reconstruction projects, participated in the street funding task force, uh, and obtained council approval to study organized trash collection in 2021. Um, there's many more than many more than these, but I just wanted to kind of share what I saw are the highlights and congratulate the commission on a very successful year, albeit a bizarre one, like Lori said. But I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what uh, what 2021 brings. That's it for me. Thanks, Andrew. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, I think, uh, Andrew, do you have meetings to put up? The calendar of meetings? Do we always put that up? Uh, I can put it up if you want. Um, I, I, would... I don't think anything has changed, right? No, no, next okay. meeting is January 21st. At this point, we're still anticipating it's gonna be virtual. Yeah. But if that changes, okay. I'll let I'll let you know. Okay. I say everybody get in line for the vaccine and um I'll take a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded. Andrew, would you uh call the roll for um for our votes? Certainly. Commissioner Aller? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Kane? Aye. Commissioner Lafferty? Aye. Commissioner McCarthy? Aye. Chair Richmond? Aye. We are adjourned. Thanks for all of, to all of you. See you Thanks next everybody. month. Thank you. See you next year. Thanks, guys. Next year, yeah. <laughs>